What's happening, weirdos? This is an incredible, wonderful, hilarious, interesting, and fun chat with my new friend Chris Estrada, who is one of the creators and the star of one of my new favorite shows. It's called This Fool. It's on Hulu. We talk about it on this episode right here on this couch. It's so hard to find new shows. It's hard, it's so hard to find great new shows. And I really think he's doing something very special. One of the EPs is Fred Armisen, and Chris kills it. It's so funny. It's so unique. Definitely, definitely, definitely check out this fool and follow Chris on all his socials and what you and what where where you follow your people. <laughs> Uh, I am currently on tour. If you want to come see me, the remaining cities are San Francisco, Portland, Seattle, Atlanta, Charlotte, and Washington, D.C. We're hopefully going to be adding new dates as well in the new year. But if you want to come and see me do my new hour of stand-up, I'm really proud of it. It's been really, really great so far, and it means so much that weirdos come out. Just go to PeteHolmes.com, and you will see links to all of the tickets there. And if you like this podcast, why not try a Pete's Pick like our friends at Ritual? When I travel, speaking of being on the road, there's only two vitamins, uh, two bottles of pills. I take a lot of different things, some for sleep, some for this, but the only ones that I absolutely always, always, always take with me are my Ritual multivitamin and my Ritual Symbiotic Plus. Symbiotic Plus is my pre, uh, pro, and postbiotic. What does that mean? It means it's all of my gut health in one easy to take delayed release pill, which means it delays release, which waits until it's in your lower intestine, which is where it needs to be to actually be effective. Uh, probiotic, which means gut health. Your gut is basically like a second brain and keeping it healthy is super, super important for virtually every area of your life. Not to mention my ritual multivitamin. As a mostly vegan person, I'm deficient in a lot of vitamins that used to be in our soil, that used to be in our food, and now taking my ritual multivitamin, when I go to the doctor, I get no notes no notes, and I can take it on an empty stomach, which is huge because if you, I don't know if you've ever taken something like zinc on an empty stomach, it will make you vomit. But Ritual has a delayed release and a minty taste, so it gets into your system and breaks down in the lower parts, into the lower intestine, where you can actually absorb this stuff. But putting a highlight on Symbiotic Plus, the Pro Pre Postbiotic contains two of the world's most studied strains. Uh, with over 350 publications of human clinical trials. It is a three-in-one clinically studied, as I mentioned, prebiotic, probiotic, and postbiotic to support a balanced gut microbiome. It doesn't need to be refrigerated, which is huge. As I mentioned, I take it with me when I travel. It's a single nested minty capsule, which means it leaves a nice minty aftertaste in your mouth and it is designed to thrive, as I mentioned, delayed release. So it will break down in your colon, not the stomach, which is the ideal place for your probiotics to survive and grow. So show your body some love, show your gut some support and show your support of this podcast. Symbiotic Plus and Ritual are here to celebrate, not hide your insides. There's no more shame in your gut game to try making something new easier. Ritual is offering weirdos 10% off their first three months when you shop online at ritual.com slash weird. Or if you prefer to shop in person, Ritual is now available at Whole Foods Market. But why not use the promo code and show that these ads are working? That's how we keep the lights on. Go to ritual.com slash weird. Do your body a favor and show your support of this show. Speaking of products that I love and have changed my life, living libations. You guys have heard us talk about living libations for many years. Our whole household is a living libations family. What does that mean? It's skin care. It's hair care. It's, it's oral care. 
everything that you put on or in your body for beauty reasons, for health reasons, to look good, to feel good. Living Libations has got you covered. Years ago, I realized I was being very careful about what I ate and what I put inside, but I wasn't being very careful about what I put on my body when it comes to things like moisturizers or shaving creams or even dental care. A lot of these things are filled with chemicals and are linked to toxicity levels and disease, stuff that is just never intended for human beings. So I was like, there's got to be another way to do this. There's got to be skin care, for example, where I can read the ingredients and actually pronounce and even recognize them because I want my food to be stuff that I recognize and I want my skincare to be the same. Enter Living Libations. I now use their zinc-based sunscreen. It's called Love the Sun. Uh, we use that for Leela every morning when we're getting her ready for, for uh, preschool. Obviously, you want to put good things on your kid's skin. Their Love the Sun is the only one that I found that is actually natural, meaning there's a lot of them that you see online that say they're natural, but they're absolutely not. They're still filled with chemicals, so just a little bit clever about it. But the Living Libation Sun uh, sun Protection is actually zinc-based and real and natural. I use their Ginger Exfoliating Scrub, which I always say is not only natural and uh, has ingredients I recognize, but it's the most badass exfoliant I've ever used in my life. I use their Zen Shave. Both Val and I use their Best Skin Ever Moisturizer before bed. Smells great, feels great going on, and keeps your skin looking vibrant and alive because it's made with ingredients that are vibrant and alive. But this is a great company to support the show because I promise if you want to buy something little or you want to do a complete house overhaul like we did, it, they have lots of stuff ranging from, you could get a tongue scraper at Living Libations or you could completely rehaul your entire beauty cabinet. Living Libations has a premium natural and wonderful product to replace the random chemical nightmares that too many of us are used to. So go to livinglibations.com and use promo code gratitude weird one word capital g capital d uh, capital w excuse me gratitude weird capital g capital w and that will get you your discount that is 15% off which is pretty great and show your support of this podcast uh, just go to livinglibations.com promo code gratitude weird. All right, everybody enjoy Chris Estrada. It's such a great conversation and be sure to check out this fool on Hulu. Get into it. Is it just regular water? It's just water. Yeah, hey, you haven't seen that before? No, I, you know what? I thought they were carbonated. They do make carbonated. Boy, <laughs> oh, do you? I, yeah. I See, think. I really think we have a lot, like everything I've learned about you from watching the show and watching your stand up. I'm like, We'll just roll right in if you cool. Oh, no, no, open, open, open. I just want you to know we're recording so you don't start saying some racist shit. <laughs> and also feel that. free to put, what's I that? stand by my racism, <laughs> I say it on air. Anything that was caught in private, please <laughs> keep it in the show as a, as a point of integrity. I insist. And you can put your feet on the couch. Oh, it's a filthy out. couch. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I really do think we get, go get comfy. Oh. I mean, I'm gonna insist. At least lean in, yeah. have, some, have some pillows. There you go. <laughs> It's, uh, this couch isn't exactly right. Oh, it's nice. It's a nice, cozy-ass couch. It truly is. You're very positive already, yeah. and I'm already enjoying it. Oh, I'm not a, like, I'm not high maintenance about it. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. Oh, the couch is fine to That's me. great. Yeah. Well, I'm going to put this back, because I was enjoying it. Um, but yeah, I was just, uh, first of all, the show is fantastic. Oh, thank you. I really um, appreciate you taking the time to watch it. Dude, it's great. Yeah. Damn. It was like... Yes, I watch it for the show, but I watch it with my wife, mm -hmm. and and she doesn't love everything. I don't love everything. Yeah, yeah. And we were both like, that was so good. We're oh, like, thanks. Now man. we're just watching it because it's what we're watching. Yeah. And I know that everybody's making this point, but it's so hard to find like what to watch. Yeah, yeah. And I, I'm glad to have this podcast because you know we were having you on, so I was like, oh, I, we should watch this fool. Yeah. But we put it on, and I was like, first of all, it's just so hard to do. I don't, can you relate? Like, I watch a lot of TV, and mm -hmm. I'm like, why? Like, why yeah. does this exist? <laughs> Not mean, even in a mean way. Yeah. You almost feel bad for them. You're like, yeah, there's I no kinda, point of view. Yeah, what there's you, no point of view, or thematically, I go, I guess I like themes in television, you know? Too. I don't like things that feel like a morality, morality play, but I like yeah. things that are thematic. Me too. Or at least mess with themes. So, or sometimes, yeah, if things lack a point of view, I'm like, you know, it, when things lack like a point of view, what I liked, 
I don't want that from scripted television. I don't mind that. Like I love bar rescue. It's like trash, sure. like trashy TV that yeah. I don't mind. Yeah. But at least that dude has a theme, which he has does. a has a has a point of view, which is don't have a shitty bar. Don't have a shitty bar. <laughs> Every, all you need is the title. He's gonna rescue. He's gonna bars. rescue your and bar. And then he goes yeah. in. And it, those shows are a delight because we all have strong opinions yeah. about dumb stuff. Yeah, yeah. But he like gets away with oh, who, he's who the hosts best. it. But? John Taffer. John Taffer. I yeah. always say. Uh, He's the father I didn't have. Because, you know, like, you need a grown man to yell at you sometimes. <laughs> Dude, you're on the right podcast. <laughs> I think all of that stuff, uh, Gordon, what's his name? The mean one, the British Ramsey. One, Gordon Ramsey. Yeah. That's all dad stuff. It's all dad stuff. Uh, Simon yeah. on American Idol. Yeah. You know why? Mm. Because they show up. They so it's show this up. fantasy. Yeah. They're, they're mad, but they're like, yeah. they understand. Like, why do you yeah. have this kitchen like this? We kind of wished. Yeah. I would watch it. Look, I, I don't mean to put my dad down. He mm. did he did, he did a great job, and yeah. I love him. But there was like, a, growing up in the 80s, like 80s yeah. dads didn't really have that yeah. that understanding or, 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 or even the goal of being like involved yeah. in, to that extent where they might come in my room and be like, I feel like your Ninja Turtles, you're getting mixed up with your G.I. Yeah. Joe's. Like, let's get those separated so you can have a more efficient playtime. I would be yeah. like, yes, sir. You know yeah, what I mean? Like, yeah, I would have yeah. kind of well, loved any attention. Yeah, my pops wasn't around. So sometimes I think seeing stuff like that yes. is like, where I, it must speak to something in me where I just go like, because I, I think of my nephews and they have their dad around, but whenever I'm kind of like stern with them. Yeah. I've seen them smile or be oh, like, yes, man. okay. Like, they're boys. Yeah, yeah, they're boys. Not to yeah. say the girls don't like it, but I've yeah. seen in particular, this is just my experience, yeah. little boys will love a yeah. leader. Yeah. Like, will love that. Like, I kind of boss thing. them around, not yes. in a mean way, but like, no, no, eat all your food first before we do this. And yeah. they'll be like, smile, okay. And then, yeah. you know, so. Because it's care. Yeah, it's care. It's also yeah. structure. Yeah. We always talk about with our daughter, it's like you. Like she has toys and stuff that count to 10. It's like one, two, three, four, five, yeah. six, seven, eight, nine, ten, <laughs> eleven, twelve. I just wanted to say yeah. it. And I was like, it would be like if you went into some weird DMT universe and everybody's a ribbon, right? There's yeah. just a bunch of ribbons and everything just looks like tie dye and everything's moving around. It's all chaos. Mm-hmm. But they give you a toy and it's like, Frank, yes. You'd, you'd take such comfort. Yeah. Like, look, everything's nuts, but flank schnoink schnank schnoink. Right. And yeah. I think they get the same way when you're like, no, yeah. here in this dimension, we eat our food first. Yes. That's what I like about that kind of television or scene like Bar Rescue. I used to say that that show is an analogy for loser dudes. Loser dudes. Like the, 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 bar, bar, is the, the dude. bar is the dude. You're so yeah. right. Because in that thing, they always tell them like, Okay, you have a cut, like dress up, but like it's it's all like physical. Like yeah. okay, this place looks needs like paint. in the it needs paint. Smells it needs, bad. Smells bad. Yes, let's hide this the kitchen. That. You have a female population about two miles away that you're not catering that's, to. Like <laughs> that's <laughs> great. It just kills me. It's all advice you it's, would give a guy. Yeah, from. it's all it's those bars eye. are. Yeah, it's queer eye, but for a restaurant. But, yes, yeah, yeah. But exactly. it's it's intense. Direct care, yeah, and somebody taking the time. I always yeah. worry though that, like, I did you ever watch The Prophet? No, it's it's a it's sort of a bar rescue. Mm-hmm. I don't want to say rip off, but like they're all sort of derivative <laughs> of each other. But this guy goes in and gets companies to like clean up their act, mm. not just business, not just a restaurant, but all types of businesses. Yeah, but you always get the feeling, and I want to know if you feel the same yeah. way. As soon as these people leave, this thing's going straight to hell. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I always look up too. Like on Bar you Rescue, do? you can see. You look up. Yeah, I look the up. And yeah, I look true? up. And then some of them, a lot of them fail. Like a lot of them, they go back to their old ways. I would absolutely. And those people that have the ideas for shows to help bars are just sort of. It's not mean exploiting. No, because they are. They are trying to help. They're trying. Yeah, yeah. But they know. Yeah. It would be like if you and I were like. Let's do it. Like American Idol is that yeah, in a yeah. big way. It's of like course, let's get yeah. people that can't sing, but we'll put it, do it under we'll the banner. Under. Like we're going to make your dreams come true. Yeah. But they know really people would like to watch someone burn and Yeah, burn, I think a lot of these bars like, I mean, <laughs> usually like for most of them, they always say they like did well after, but I look to see like yeah. where are they now after yeah. three to four let's years. Get on Yelp. And a lot let's of, see what Yelp says. Yeah. A lot, some of them, like a fair amount that I see are closed. Yeah. Like, or... For reasons that they went back to their old ways or whatever. Because yeah. 
It's just, I mean, they um, need a, a therapist in there to be like, do you want to be in the restaurant business? That or business school, you know, like, <laughs> like business school. <laughs> yeah, but I hear you. Business school would help. But yeah. I think like if there's like, it's like there's a projector, right? And it's trying to play a movie yeah. of owning a bar. And they can you can clean the screen as much as you want. But if you don't take that piece of shit off the yeah. lens, right? I know we've yeah, all heard that yeah. analogy. But I think they do need to go in and go like, do you like service? Yeah, yeah. Like, do you yeah. like food service? Yeah, I think Does some it, like, people like light you up at all. I, I think the places that run well are like people who like, like that are like. There's places that I've looked up that are still running. Yeah, and I I always got the feeling that those people just got like hit with hard times yes. or some shit happened. Yes, like. Or you could tell they they like it. They like being in the service industry. Like right. there was this guy who ran this place in Vegas. It was like an old school mob joint. Okay. And then like even the Rat Pack would go there. And I don't know. He just he seemed like he liked it. It just he was like hitting hard times. And that place is still around. He's doing great. Yeah, yeah. So. Because it, I think I have this theory that a lot of people a lot the reason why a lot of teachers suck. Mm-hmm. Is because that's the job choice of people who don't know what to do. Yeah, I'm not even putting it down. No, 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 no. It sounds no, no. like I'm making fun. Yeah. I'm just saying a lot of people strike out. I get it. I actually feel for them. Mm-hmm. What do you do? And you go like, well, who have I seen? You've probably seen some teachers. Yeah. Second tier down. What do you do? I go out to restaurants. You know, yeah. like waiter. Yeah. And then like bar, but like. It's not just you like being in bars or you have the fantasy of like you talk to the customers, you go to the bar, they give you yeah. a shot of something. Yeah. It's not that. It's you, not romanticism. No, you yeah. actually have to like enjoy the thought that other people had a great time. Yeah. Like yeah. To be a chef or a restaurant owner. Like, it's those people who love being bartenders when they like at a busy bar, they're like, no, nah, this shit, it's fast, it's yes, moving. Yes. Like it's not the cheers fantasy. Right. You know, it's where like it's slow. Yeah, where it's slow <laughs> and you're chopping it up with everyone. They're like, no, no, no. We wanna fucking they wanna feel like rock stars where they're moving fast. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Spinning a bottle every once yeah, yeah. in a while. Oh, that, every once in a while. Not yeah. every bottle. Not every bottle. The yeah, amateurs yeah. spin every bottle. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's so funny, man. I went to bartending school. Oh, did you? Yeah, because I know he scandalized, but Bill Cosby was a bartender oh. and he was a hero of mine. I was yeah. like, what? how do you become a comedian? Yeah. And I think in those days, it was the 50s, yeah. that like was open micing it. Yeah. Like, there were sense. no open mics, so you there's, had to be a yeah, funny bartender. Comedian. I like Colin Quinn a lot. He used to be a bartender. Oh, really? Yeah. You he, can tell. Yeah. He's got yes, that, you could tell. Yeah. You, he kind of has that old barb. Like He could make my dad laugh and he can make me laugh. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's incredibly... Yeah. I love that bit you had about, you didn't call it Warehouse Funny, but if I was mm. tracking your CD. You know what's so funny? It's called Warehouse Funny. Is I it? literally, when I On write it down, list? it's called Warehouse Funny. Yeah. Because <laughs> it should be called yeah. Warehouse it's Funny. It's called Warehouse Funny. That's exactly what it's called. Warehouse Funny, because <laughs> yeah. I was a waiter at Bennigan's mm. 150 South Michigan yeah. <laughs> in Chicago. It's gone. Huh. It's a Walgreens now. But um, I was a waiter there, and I related to your bit yeah. so hard oh, thanks. that there's like different. Yeah, there's just different levels of being funny. Like sometimes being at funny at work doesn't translate to like being funny anywhere I'm gonna else. I'm going to say yeah. always. It always, yeah, translate. you're right. You're right. It never yeah. translates. Never. It's a completely. Yeah. Robert Klein had this great line, which was haunting to me in my early years. But he was like, "There's a big difference between being funny." And being funny at eight o'clock on a Friday night at a comedy, oh, like, it's a huge it's showing difference. up to be funny. It's showing it's up. It's a job. It's a yes. Yeah, and it, it, it's like a craft at that point. It's a craft, and it's yeah. a, a huge disappointment if all the people pay like thirty five, fifty bucks yeah. each, and you suck. I know. Like very different yeah. from like you're hungover at work and you're just not funny that day. No problem. No problem. Nobody's Nobody, mad. Yeah, and they Nobody. can't be that. I know. I was, I was like telling someone that's like. What sucks is about like with certain jobs you can be depressed and do it fine. Yes. But like I, I we were talking about I was like telling my friend about flying and like what worries me is those pilots that like killed themselves, you know, like that Malaysian air flight that is went there, missing. I don't know the story. That, that, that Mal- there were a few years ago there was a Mar- oh, Malaysian I air that. flight. I guess I never got the. There's a strong speculation that that guy killed himself oh. and that he was depressed. And then I go, you just don't want a depressed pilot. <laughs> Look, I don't I don't like putting this bad <laughs> stuff out there, but I've had that thought in New York in a yeah. cab being like 
First of all, I don't think this guy even remembers that I'm in here. Yeah, yeah. I don't mean an Uber. I mean yeah. a cab. Yeah, <laughs> like, of course. Like, yeah. Straight up, he might just be driving around yeah. New York right now. Yeah, and, I, and we're going over bridges and stuff. Yeah. And I'm just like, <laughs> like trying to talk talk yeah. to him. A little bit. <laughs> like, yeah, hey, what's going on? Give that guy on? some hope or something. Give him a little little chatter. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. T- tell him got a great back ahead. <laughs> I love this back ahead. But it's true, like the the interconnectedness of humanity. But that doesn't just end with like flights. Flights is a really Mm. Obvious example, but your dentist, your doctor, those are those are good yeah. examples. The people who serve your food, I know the amount of trust is insane. It's and you're insane. in a warehouse yeah. shipping things out. Yeah, you'd have to go out of your way to like put anthrax or something. Oh, or something. of course, but yeah. still, yeah. So. it's a, hu- a human packed a box. Is that yeah. the kind of warehouse it was? Yeah, was it? I worked at a car parts warehouse, so okay. it was like, and I've worked at several warehouses throughout my life, but it was just like, it just would make me laugh because when I was at a warehouse, anytime I worked any job. Like I would, especially at a warehouse job, I would, I would crack myself up because I thought I was like, God, I fucking hate this job. Yes. So I would always go up to one of my coworkers and jokingly, I would say, Hey, don't tell anyone, but I'm with undercover boss. <laughs> like, and then, so like funny. just kind of bullshit with them. And they would <laughs> laugh and think I was an idiot and like. But it's just That's one of those things bit, that, though. like, it would never work anywhere. Zero one percent of them is like, is Chris? <laughs> yeah, is Chris an undercover? Like, I believe you as an undercover boss. <laughs> you joke about that on the show that you like look older than you yeah, are. Yeah, yeah. So there's something like yeah. I could see you as a CEO. Yeah. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. That's yeah. like just kind of pretending to be in the warehouse. Yeah, but yeah, there's just something to being. It's so funny how certain funnies only work in a specific place. Well, that's what, not to be, I'm catching myself not to be hurt about this, but I did notice in my family Mm. when they would come and see me do stand-up or whatever, it was confusing to them. Because first of all, it wasn't about them. Mm. I'm just kind of like talking about my thoughts. And I think they wanted it to be more warehouse funny. (laughs) Yeah. They wanted me to like engage. In fact, that's what bad audiences often are. It's like, why isn't he talking about me? Yes. Yeah. Like you should like do snaps on me. Man, I didn't come here to do snaps oh. on the front row. Yeah. That's what happened to me one time I was at an Acme <laughs> in Minneapolis. I hear that. And then a good club. it's an amazing club. Yeah. But somebody up front said, roast me. And then I said, well, fuck, you think I'm Jeff Ross? Right. Like, I mean, God, that's a skill. Yeah. I, it's a great skill. Yes. And I think, and I enjoy watching it, but it's not what I do. I had that yeah. at the lab here in LA yeah. where there was a dude in the front who, of course, I found out like five minutes after talking to him that he was also a comic. And I'm like, what do you, oh, like, I just noticed everyone was clapping when I came up. I wasn't even announced. It wasn't like a, a, a big deal that I was yeah. there. I was just one of the comics on the lineup. And he was like this. Oh. And I was like, I just, I addressed it to him because I wanted to loosen him. Yeah. Not to like make fun of him. I was like, everybody's clapping, but this guy right in the front row, everyone could see him with mm-hmm. his arms crossed. And I was like, what's going on? And he was like, look at how you're dressed. He started like roasting me. Oh, really? And I was like, yeah, that's not what this is. Yeah. Like it's not 1973 Melrose improv. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not all smoking cigarettes. Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> wearing it's sunglasses right. inside. Yeah, yeah. Long ash. <laughs> like, yeah. You need to ash that thing. It's long ash yeah. about to fall off being like, nice pants. They come in your size. Like get out of here. I know. That's not what this is. I hate when I see someone say that to someone like, what do you guys want to talk about? I've seen, and I go, yeah. You talk about something. You talk about it. <laughs> you know what it is? You're actually making me realize that what makes comedy, and I do believe it's mm. art. I, I, I believe it can be stupid. Yeah, yeah, I believe absolutely. it can be base. Yeah. But it can, it's still art, even mm-hmm. when it's stupid and even when it's base. But one of the things that makes it art, which sort of makes it corny, mm. is that you are talking about your inner reality. Yeah. Like you're bringing yeah. your thoughts and your feelings and expressing them. Yeah. So doing roasts, I'm not saying Jeff, I'm, I'm saying bullshitting yeah, with the crowd course. or what else do you want to talk about is kind of a defense because yeah. if you try and if you do talk about your, your fears or your hopes or whatever... That's a vulnerable play. You're basically showing them like a painting of your of your insides. Yeah. It just <laughs> that's what I think it's more interesting to be like, well, I have these abstract thoughts, so let me see how I can make them funny to a broader audience yes. while still maintaining some yes. uniqueness or abstraction to them, you know. Well, like, that's yeah. Yeah, it's just yeah, I think that's what it is. I mean, and also it's like it is an art form, but I also in 
I hate being profound about it at the same time too. Well, it ruins it. Yeah, it ruins it. Yeah. yeah. It's an art form that requires you to not behold it at too much of an as yeah. an art form yeah, to yeah. do it. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes, yes. I have to imagine a lot like landing a plane. Like <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to go back to pilot. Yeah. Don't think about how amazing it is. Just it, land the plane. Just land it. Just land yeah. it. Nobody just cares fucking, that you're like really shit. I'm a mathematician. Yeah. It's really a game of I angles. Calculated and this. Wind speed. Just land the plane. Just, yeah. Nobody just cares. <laughs> and and you can think it's an art, but don't tell every passenger they're deplaning. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Only planes get their own verb for leaving it. I know. You don't decar. Okay, yeah. forget it. <laughs> okay, forget it. That was, I love that you laughed. Here's a couple things before we get to some specifics that I loved about the show, but I wanted to talk about, I went on your, on your gram mm-hmm. and I noticed references to Adaptation, which is one of my favorite movies. Oh, I love that movie. And Minor Threat, which oh, is, yeah, did you grow yeah. up with yeah, punk rock? Yeah, I grew rock? up in punk rock music. I'm assuming you don't that. still throw on Minor Threat, but maybe you do. Oh, no, I still do. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. I still, I still. I don't know why I projected that onto you. So you you'll still listen to yeah. Out of Step. <laughs> yeah, I still listen to all that stuff. I think, I think. Um, at one time, the singer of Minor Thread and Fugazi, this guy Ian Mackay, he said this thing that I thought was really profound, which he said, "I didn't grow out of, I didn't grow out of punk rock. I grew up with it." Mm. So that's like, how you feel. That's how I feel. I feel like. It still resonates like that kind of anger, like it's interesting. Yeah, like uh, all that stuff still resonates to me. And I grew up listening to it here in LA, and it felt like such a. I think it's shaped me to who I am. So I still, I think I listen to more things, you know, like. Yeah. But I still listen to that. There was no judgment here. I oh yeah, I, I thought know. maybe you threw it into gear, being like, "Look, I, I like other oh, stuff." No. The Anthrax house is right around the corner. Oh really? You know that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's not the Minor Thread house where they're yeah, sitting yeah. on the steps. And there's the Glenn Danzig house is around. Oh, here, that's so what it is. It's, it's not Danzig. Anthrax. Yeah, it's, it's the like Danzig house. The Danzig house, yeah. Which is like this weird abandoned house yeah, weird that ab- we all know belongs <laughs> to Danzig, and he does nothing with it. <laughs> and it's really just kind of falling apart, which yeah. is. Kind of punk rock. Yeah, that's good for, yeah, very misfits. <laughs> yeah, it's very misfits indeed. But I all, I loved Minor Threat. Were you straight edge? You know, I wasn't. I, man, I started everything really young. Like I was never. Doing like drugs I, and stuff? Yeah, like I smoked weed when I was 10 for the first time. 10? Yeah, with Who my neighbor. You? My <laughs> <Your> na- neighbor? <laughs> my neighbor's uncle used to sell weed. And then we smoked, and one time his uncle left, and then he came over, and we smoked weed together at like 10 or 11. How I think. old was he? He was the same age. He was like 10 or 11. And then he came over. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you meant it was 10 or 11 at night. Oh, no, no, no. So, so, <laughs> I was like, first of all, that's too late to be up yeah, at 10. Uh, but you were 10 or 11, and you smoked weed. 10 or 11, smoked weed. Did you get high? I, they say you don't get you high. You know what's the so funny time, but. is I think when I was a kid, I just. I just remember going, I knew I was high, but I didn't feel it. But in hindsight, I knew we were high because we went to the store to buy a bunch of munchies. You got the munchies. Yeah, we got the munchies. I've told this story before, but yeah. I, I uh, got my friend stoned for the first time. And he got paranoid that he wasn't stoned, mm-hmm. which is the funniest yeah, way to be really stoned. Funny. He's like, it's not working. It's not working. And I was like, see this. I was also stoned. Yeah. But I was like, see the way you're being. Yeah. This is stoned. <laughs> like, like yeah. this is it. Yeah. And he finally, it's weird that it requires like a yes from you or some sort yeah. of surrender or participation. It's a surrender. A surrender. Yeah, to a be surrender. high well. Yeah, to be and, high well. Yeah. Or resist it. Then, yeah. And you're and then you have these terrible paranoid. Yeah, and you're fighting it. And you're fighting, and you don't even think it's happening. And it's like the reason why the cliche is like the big Lebowski, it's like get in the bathtub yeah, and get a roach club, like now. fucking relax. Yeah. So you smoked it at 10. Did that have like an effect on you? I don't mean to sound so no. square, but I was 28. I, I think. You know, I, I grew up here in LA. And so like that kind of like drug culture was around people selling weed, like people slanging dope and like yeah. selling drugs. You knew it to be around, you would see people sell drugs. So it wasn't a big deal. It wasn't like a big deal. And you also, I had smelled it before, like in the yeah. neighborhood and stuff. But it was my friend came over and he was like, my uncle left. He had a joint, like a rolled up joint. And we're like, yeah, let's smoke it. And, you know, I think I smoked after that f- for like recreationally once I got into high school with friends and stuff like so that. So after 10, you waited till like. I, I think, yeah, yeah. I remember oh, just like never smoking again till like high school. And then. I drank beer. I think I got drunk the first time when I was like 12, like 12 or 13. Oh, wow. 
And then what was that situation? Same kid? M- m- no, this my other getting... friend. My other friend. His brother <laughs> bought us a twelve pack. His brother was older, and I think we just said like we want to get fucked up. And his brother was like, "All right, I'm gonna buy you guys a twelve pack. Get drunk at like at home. At home. Did was that what did you think? Was yeah, he yeah. Thinking, like do it safe. Yep, kinda? yep. And we ended up buying a twelve pack. He got us a twelve pack. We ended up getting drunk and. But I didn't drink again till like high school and smoke weed till high school. And I never had a problem, but I just wasn't straight edge. But what I did is I respected it. Yeah. Like I Even just the go, substances? No, I respected the fact oh, that they edge. were straight edge. Yeah. You know, or the fact that like people, it's almost a discipline I wish I had, even though I wasn't like necessarily. Well, you were almost there. <laughs> yeah. Like the fact that they were just like, I'm not going to let this ruin my life. Yes. You know. I related yeah. hard to that. Yeah. Because they made it cool to quote Huey Lewis. <laughs> they made mm. it hip to be square. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I wasn't doing that stuff for religious reasons. Yeah. But then I'm in the punk and the hardcore scene. Yeah. And I got to say I was straight edge and everybody just thought it was like a cool kind of because it is. It I is look, cool. yeah. I know I'm Absolutely a 43 year old cool. lame old dad now, but I'm like, if you're into punk rock and you're sober. Like that dude's dangerous. <laughs> you know yeah, what I mean? Like, <laughs> like yeah. who, else, what's, what's up with him? Yeah. Like he wants to mush and all he's had today is a cup of yeah. tea. <laughs> or it also feels like too, like it also, I heard maybe it was like Henry Rollins or Ian McKay who said like, they want you to become a cliche so you're not functional. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And they want you to be self-destructive. Yeah. You know, this kind of authoritarian rule or whatever yeah. that, that like, abstract they is yeah like so you're not mobilizing or doing things to change your life for the better or, that's right or so you're not to keep you down yeah or to you know be a consumer and stuff like that so that kind of idea i really like like i always thought even sometimes when i i feel like sometimes even when i want to buy like junk food like a bottle of coke or something yeah i have to tell myself that i have to make it an enemy oh it's how you don't do it yeah it's how i don't do it by making it an enemy I think that's brilliant. Yeah. Because who is telling you that it's freedom? In fact, like Coke, yeah. Coke is always my go-to example that yeah. the advertisement is always like partying on a beach or, yeah. like, or like having the best time of your life with the most beautiful person yeah. you've ever met. It's like it's bubble sugar water. Like I don't yeah. know, And we know that, yeah. but we're so susceptible to images. But like that one step of removal to say like, who told you that getting fucked up was yeah. like what kings do? Yes, it's yeah. not what kings do. No, it's not what kings do. Actually, kings because they didn't get fucked up or exactly. You know, like, yeah. They're quite lame. I, I'm yeah. sure. I, I mean, I'm sure some of those inbred weirdos in <laughs> Europe were just like inherited it, like yeah. with an eye on yeah. like this far <laughs> over. Like they drank a lot yeah. of ale and mead and shit. But like a lot of the people that you tend to admire. That's why I always get bummed out when you see Michael Jordan. Not really bummed out, but like Michael Jordan doing. McDonald's commercials, yeah, and you're like, I get it. Nobody, first of all, I don't know, man. I can't judge, but like, you don't eat that stuff. Yes. Like, you don't. Like, yeah. and it's kind of we've sort of gotten a little bit wiser to, to that it. idea. Yeah, even like That's the milk camp. Yeah, <laughs> I thought sometimes I want to have like soda or junk food, and I have to tell myself, no, they want you to buy it's, it blindly. It's what they and want. It's and then that helps me. Because yeah. then I, if I make it an enemy in that sense. Like, well, what makes it an enemy is anything that's a corporation that wants you to get hooked on their product. Yeah. It's, it is a drug and, and sugar or uh, other addictive things. There, there's no... Yeah. Why is one thing a drug and one is... I, I know this is like, you know, <laughs> who needs to hear me talk about this stuff again? No, but... But you did bring it up. No, <laughs> I, I talk but, about this stuff a but, lot. But that's what I... Uh, that's what I love about that, even though, and even to this day, I I can I like to have a drink here and then, sure. here and there, but like, I that's what I like about that straight edge mentality is yeah. that like, it's like, I'm not going to lose control. Right. Because then I'm ineffective. And doing it consciously, that's yeah. the, I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't fuck. It's funny that yeah. sex is one of them. At least I can fucking think, yeah. right? So that Minor Threat song was... You know, the beginning of being like, oh, it's cool to have yeah. discernment or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Because like blindly not doing stuff or blindly doing stuff, both are both are yeah. blind. Yeah. Like, and I know that because I have a self-destructiveness to me that I would want. I, and I feel like I have to make things the enemy because I do have like addictive behaviors. Me too. You know, and like I used to smoke cigarettes. I used to smoke like a pack and a half a day. Oh, wow. And like... 
or sometimes I would binge things or I still at do. some point I got into I did do like heavy drugs and and it's because I know I have a like a self destructiveness. Yeah. So if I don't make it an end, like I, there's a self loathing part of me that it's yes. like, yeah, you're a piece of shit. Do this because you're a piece of shit. But yeah. if I make it, then me, then I can go. No, don't do that. It's a it's a battle. It's not a fix. It's yeah. It's just somebody selling you a fake fix. Yeah. So yeah. they can get rich and go on vacation. Yeah. yeah. On your pain. Yeah. Which is it's true. <laughs> what we're I I know you know how I know I'm binging because it it doesn't happen often. But like this is such a lame example, but like I housed pretty much an entire bag of pistachios, <laughs> which is yeah, I sound so dumb. But like you know how I knew, and I know Katie, it's so dumb. <laughs> but they were spicy. Yeah. Something that's spicy, like you eat it, and then like you get that flare yeah. up of pain. Mm. This is addiction, yeah. and you're actually chasing that. It has nothing to do no. with like your stomach or yeah. hunger. You're just trying to like kind of cut yourself a yeah. little bit. And that probably goes into some sort of weird, yeah. I deserve pain sort of place. But like, I know I'm binging if I say, how many pistachios is enough? And I can hear my voice goes right back. It goes, never, <laughs> never <laughs> enough. And then I know I have to stop. I can't always yeah. do it, but that's when I'm in that addiction place. Yeah. What? I used to binge in the way with like my, uh, I would do drugs with a friend and then I would go say this whole weekend, like let's party. Yeah, and then, black and white. Yeah. It's like we're already doing it. We're already doing and it. And we're already going to feel bad, yeah. so let's just do it a ton let's and then feel really ton. bad on Monday. Yeah. That's real. Yeah. I, I, I'm I, just saying I have that too. Yeah. That's why I had to stop drinking because I was like, if I drink, I'm like, well, we're doing this. Yeah. So like do it. Yes. It's actually kind of what made me good yeah. at stand-up. It's what made, like, yeah. at the lifestyle. Because yeah. I was like, we're going to do it, so we should do it. We should do it every night. We yeah, should do same, it in New York. Same, same sort of compulsion. Yeah. But like I had to get enlightened to the idea yeah. that I was like, you need to sick that never ending hungry dog on the right thing. Um, yes. Because if yeah. you just let it eat Doritos, I think I'd be dead. Yeah. <laughs> or that's so or like, you know, you or I'd have the attitude of like, yeah, let's get fucked up and we'll f deal with it on Monday or We'll see how far we can take it and who knows. Right. You like know. it might go into Monday. Yeah. It might go into Monday or ah, you're not even, yeah, I'll get fucked up. I don't even care what happens. Yeah. And then. Well, that was also it know. too. Sorry. So yeah, it's just that kind of thought of just like doing that kind of stuff. And then it's like that kind of addictive behavior and self-loathing that I always have to be careful with. Same. Yeah. And I think that's, by the way, everybody. Yeah. Meaning I don't think it's like, oh, addicts have like self loathing yeah, yeah, you're right. Other people yeah. are exercising so they look fantastic, but their addiction is exercising. Mm -hmm. Or it's money. It's these things that- Or it's uh, work. Or it's work. Yeah. It's things that cult our culture values. Mm -hmm. So like our strange compulsions stick out yes. because they look like body weight or they look yeah. like inactivity or, or hangovers or whatever it mm -hmm. might be. But a lot of people, I don't, I don't think anybody's off the hook when it comes to like- strange, unconscious, and also unbridled rage, yeah. self-loathing, confusion, fear, disgust, yeah. jealousy, uh, disloyalty, like yeah. people that just like think everything is attacking them so they have yeah. to attack it. That's happening in that happiest... Like yeah. I'm not trying to put Mr. Rogers down. I, I love Mr. Rogers. I'm saying like he dealt with that too. Yeah. Like there's no exception. Yeah. Being in these bodies, living in yeah. this earth means sometimes you look at somebody and you just go, fuck this guy for no reason. Yeah. Or or he's gonna kill me for no reason. Like fear, yeah. jealousy, anger. So we we medicate it in different ways. And the, I, the reason I love talking about this is it's nice to know we're not alone. Yeah. And there are healthy, there are healthier ways. I'm going to say yeah. it is better to go for a walk oh, than yeah, it is to absolutely. get fucked up. Then get fucked up, yeah. <laughs> and it's also... And they might have the same effect on your brain, like literally. Yeah. Like a good walk yeah. can sometimes be, it yep. sounds so lame, but, but like having two beers. Or run. Yeah. Yes, that exactly, it does it. It's just, you know what it is? It's like with some people, sometimes they can't fight the self-loathing. That's right. You know, because... Because you need to love yourself a little bit yeah, to do that walk. to do that stuff, you know. I've said it a million times. Yeah. I, I don't have a bottle of jogging in my freezer. I had a bottle of vodka. Yeah. You know, it was easier. It was easier, you know. Because it reaffirms if you think you're 
Like, if you, you go, I'm a piece of shit, so yeah. therefore I'm doing piece of shit stuff. Wasn't the show originally called Punk Ass Bitch? Is yeah, it was right? originally yeah. called that. Your yeah. website still says Punk Ass Bitch. Oh, we've before. been meaning to take it off. <laughs> I've, I'm awful with my website. and I don't think anybody cares. Or It's only yeah. old people like me that's like, let's no. check out his URL. <laughs> no, I, I care about other people's website, but I'm just bad at doing my own. I mean, <laughs> that's how I found out. <laughs> yeah, that I, I actually like this fool. Oh, same here. Better. I thought it Punk Ass Bitch would have been a gimmicky like name. Yes, it and it's not a gimmicky, gimmicky show. Yeah, it's not a gimmicky show. Yeah, and the and the only thing that was the title just came from a joke that I wrote several years ago. This fool. Yeah, the 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 title Punk Ass Bitch. Came oh, from the title. That punk yeah, yeah, it came from. And then I just told the guys that I created the show with like. I don't think we should name it that. Oh, that's I, great. I thought maybe yeah, somebody pulled, reined no, you in. No, they said, I, we should, I don't go, I don't think we should name it that because it wouldn't dimensionalize us, the show. Completely. And, uh, this and fool to me sounds like, I don't know, like an invitation to understanding a different yeah. terminology. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like white people don't use fool as yeah, much yeah. as the Latino community. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So I was like, oh, yeah. cool. I, I kind of get it. Yeah, Is that it kind of works in both ways. Like there's the literal fool full to it right to the show and a bit of like just saying like how latinos usually say full a lot you know right. so yeah there was a little bit of that and i just once we had an artist do the title art which is awesome oh thanks very yeah. la very cool yeah i just said oh there's an elegance to it that i think yeah. is nice i yeah. gotta say it again man just because it's just so rare to watch a show where you're like this show wanted to be Oh, like you. what I mean, you know what I mean? Like so many people make a show because they were offered a show. Yeah. This seems like, oh, this needed to be. There's nothing like it. Oh, there's no story man. like this. Yeah. There's no there's no vibe or flavor. Mm -hmm. It wasn't derivative. I couldn't predict it. Mm -hmm. And it's an incredible, incredible pilot. One oh, of the best. Thank you. One of the best openings of a show. <laughs> I won't ruin it, but <laughs> oh, the driving. No. Yeah, the driveway thing. Look, I hate this. Yeah. I, I don't hate it about myself, but we all go into new shows going like Let's see what we got. You oh, know yeah. what I mean? Just, yeah. I can't shut it off. Yeah, of course. But I'm like, obviously. Especially going when you in, create, you know? Oh, yeah. yeah oh, yeah. I'm going to be like, this yeah. guy thinks he can make a show. Yeah. I'm not saying that's how I consciously think. Mm -hmm. Somewhere back there. And when you did the thing with the car, I was like, God damn it. Oh, <laughs> like, like, like you're yeah. almost mad it's so good. Yeah. And Val you. Val was sitting next to me and she was like, that's the funniest opening to a show. I've oh, seen. thanks, man. I so really it's just appreciate nice that. to see. You can feel yeah. your drive and your and your desire to make it. Yeah. That makes sense. Not just like, oh, I can make a show. This show. Let's make this show. Yeah. I think when I met with the guy, I co-created the show with some comedians. Um Jake Weissman, Matt Ingebrigtsen, and Pat Bishop. They used to have a show on Comedy Central called Corporate. Mm -hmm. And then when that was an underrated show. Yeah, really underrated yeah, yeah, show. Yeah. They, and then when they hit me up to do it, you know, I kind of had no thoughts of. I had some ideas, but so they approached you. Yeah, they approached me, and they said they we just should, knew you from comedy. They knew me from stand up. They okay. knew me from the this LA is a great scene. Story. I love this. Yeah, they knew me, and I was like, you know, I was. You know how it is, stand-up doesn't pay until it pays, so for a long time you just have a job. Yeah, it's and like skateboarding. Yeah. You're either really bad at it or suddenly you're amazing. Yeah. At it. <laughs> and, like, yeah. and I was working at my warehouse job when they hit me up. Yeah. And then doing stand-up at night and on the road on the weekends and stuff. Sure. And then they hit me up and they were like, we, we're like producing stuff now, which you want to work on something with us. And I love this. Yeah, I was this is working. what I want comedians to be doing with each other. Yeah. Like I, I never hear stories like this. Yeah, they were real cool. Running around trying to get something for themselves, but they approached yeah. you. Yeah, because they already had their show on Comedy Central and they said, we're like looking to produce stuff and make other stuff. And wow. then I said, yeah, they hit me up. I remember it was like I was working, literally unloading a truck. Mm. And then I said, yeah, let's meet up or whatever. And then... They told me, they go, we're kind of thinking of something in regards to where you live, that part of South Central, South Central Los Angeles, and what you kind of talk about in your stand-up a little bit mm. tonally. And I said, all right, cool. And then I kind of came up with, and then we started crafting it together. I came up with the general idea yep. of a guy who works at a gang rehabilitation program. Yep. And then, because... I had gang, I had family members that were gang members and had been to your prison. Your cousin, your real cousin. Yeah, my real cousin. Of, was that drug? Of, yeah, not that it matters. I'm oh, interested it was, if it was drugs. Yeah, it was directly 
a few of my cousins. Okay. A few of my cousins who had been in prison, who had been in gangs. Which is kind of addressed in the show, yeah. which is the like the corporate, the, the money, what is it? Mm-hmm. it it's uh, what Mike, Michael Imperioli says. Oh, the nonprofit. Uh, it's like you guys are victims. Yeah, which, you're victims which, of, which is yeah. true. It's like yeah. there's this insane... Like you a build prison the prisons, industrial complex. The, yeah, that's yeah, what it is. To make money and And it's whatnot. like, okay, so we need to fill this yeah. and then you get the people and you yeah. put them in. Yeah, and it's, it's a like, cycle. Oh, Absolutely. And um, we started crafting it from there and they said, oh, we like this, but we don't want to make it just a workplace. Like what's this guy's home life like? Yeah. And what are his relationships like? And we started kind of modeling after themes that I had in my head and one of them was like codependency. And then I just, I've always been intrigued by the idea of like codependency after I found out what it was. And I kind of found out in the funniest way I had a, I got done with a relationship. This woman had broken up with me, and I was telling my my friend, telling her what happened, and she said she sounds like she's codependent. So I said, "What's that?" And she kind of described it to me. So I bought a book on codependency. Codependent, no more. No, women who love too much. <laughs> and then I always joke around that I found out I was a woman who loves too much. Yes. Because when I read the book, I said, "I think this is me." You're co- yes. Because I, the only reason I bought that book was to say, I'm going to learn what codependency is so I can help her ass out. Yes. I can help her ass not be codependent no more. Yes. And then then I thought the fact that I'm doing, after reading that book, I said, I think the fact that I'm trying to help her is codependency. Is codependency. Yes. Because my life was in sh- r- like shambles, you know? Right. So also what I liked was also just the, it's the idea of like... Um, what is altruism? You know, like you're kind of you don't you don't know. Some people are altruistic, but some people are kind of helping others. A lot of codependency is to kind of help, help others to forget your own problems, yes. and then pat yourself in the back about it. That's right. So you can tell yourself also, you're a good guy because you don't believe yourself to be a good guy. To project or a good your person. problems into other people, and it's yeah, like, I'm going to fix you. Yes, when it's like, wait. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I'm only I'm not really seeing what I don't like about myself. And yeah, you. yeah, I've said this before on the pod, but it's uh, this is a hundred percent out of life. I I was in a codependent relationship, and I said to her, I was like, I just found out what it was. How mm. old are you? Man, I was like 27. Okay, because I didn't find out what it was until I was like mm. 32, yeah. 31 maybe. Mm-hmm. And I said to her, I was like, we we should read Codependent No More. And she went, Let's read it together. And she wasn't. She wasn't kidding. Oh my god! She wasn't kidding. And that's when I. But it's one of those things. Like, how many people? Like Val and I know. That's my yeah. wife. We have codependent tendencies. Like yeah, we have to and keep I know an that too. It. Yeah, it's just like it's happening. Yeah, but we're kind of like we go like as long as it's working for us. Like you know what I mean. Like, but also having an awareness is good. It's not having an awareness of it. Right. You know. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you can regulate something if you have an awareness of it. What did what? I, I'm actually asking in case you remember better than me. Uh, th- that's not saying I'm not embarrassed that I can't define it exactly, but it's it's nebulous. It's like mm. it's like needing. Yeah, needing to help others in order to forget your own, in order to avoid is. your own problems. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. Because, uh, did you know uh, Father Greg Boyle did this podcast from oh, Homeboy Industries? Wow, yeah, that's it's one amazing. of the best episodes. Yeah, and he, one of the things I love about him is that he'll tell you. That he's in homeboy to help himself, like he's doing it, not not yeah. out of codependency, but he's like, I'm not trying to save anybody. Mm. I, I'm saved when I work with them, like through yeah. the process of it. Yeah. But it is interesting, and I thought the show does a, a great job of making fun of the idea that it's like the cupcakes or or like who's helping who that sort of yeah. stuff, because that is how most people are. Father Greg is yeah. is just a living oh, saint. <laughs> yeah, he's a living saint. Yeah, <laughs> you can't, you absolutely. Can't. But. When I help people, mm-hmm. what is altruism and what yeah. is codependency? And how much do I just, I can't bear the thought that I am not useful yeah. or think of others, but that's just because of me. Yeah, and it's just one of those things. It's like sometimes, yeah, I find myself in these situations where like even with my family, I, they would ask me f- to help them with something. and Families are codependent. Maybe. Yeah, and I would go... I would say with an attitude, all right, I'll fucking do it. And then my mom would say, well, don't help me with that face. And I go, no, no, I want to help. And then like, so it's like one of those things where it's like, it was just funny to help in a way that's like, I just wanted to say that I did it. You yeah. Know? 
Of and course. And like because your identity when it comes to family, yeah. it hinges on like good son, bad son. Yeah. Close family, not close family. Some of those things are too painful to deal with. Yeah. And for me, I often do stuff like let's say my dad will ask me to call his friend's 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 <laughs> son who wants to get into comedy. Yeah. And I'll say to Val, I'm like, I know there's there is a route. I, I tree graph it. I go, I could go, Dad. I really wish you would ask me, like, mm. do you mind reaching? Like, you just tell me to yeah. do it. I don't feel like you see me as a grown up. I don't yeah. think that I don't feel respect or whatever it might be. However, I want to articulate yeah. that. But when I plan it out, I'm like, okay, it's a three month no or a 30 second yes. <laughs> yeah. And I just go, sure, dad. And yeah. I call this guy and then I have a laugh with him because he didn't want his dad to put yeah, him in touch. Course. Like, yeah. neither of us wanted it to happen. Yeah. Sometimes you actually make a friend out of it. But like nothing was gained, learned, or achieved. Like yeah. my dad doesn't have any better understanding yes. of me yeah. or my feelings. Yeah. So it's like a temporary fix. But I'll pick that temporary fix rather than the... Yes. Because you know why, dude? I don't think at the end of that three months that it's even possible that my dad would go like, you know, I never even thought that you might have felt that way. Yes. He'd just be like, oh, big shot, son. Yes. Doesn't yes. have time for yeah. his father. It would be three uh, months of that. Yeah. And then would end in the same spot, or I can just go, fuck, man, okay. <laughs> and I'm not proud of that. Yeah. But it's also a lot of that I think probably has to do with accepting who your father is. I love that. Yeah. Yes. Me you know, forgiving that. And yeah. Just, and I think surrendering like to yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think it's like, it's just accepting. You yeah. know, I think it'd be different if you were going out of your way to help this person in a way for you to, or, to like kind of pat yourself in the back about it. You're you right. Know? Yeah, I want to yeah. just get it over with. Yeah, you just kind of want to get it over <laughs> with and you'll you'll do a solid for your dad and his friend. Right. You know, as opposed to like, let me take this young person under my wings. And stay on top of them and stay for the on next top six of years. Them. So my dad will go like, well done, my well, good and yes. faithful servant. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, we were just trying to get in themes of like codependency. It's but a also, great theme. Oh, thanks, man. And then also just looking at things through like a working class lens, you know, yep. like the fact that these people live in South Central Los Angeles and kind of trying to depict a LA that like isn't like the rest of LA. It's or, literally the flyover part. Yeah. Of it. Yeah. It's literally the literally, flyover you part. See when yeah. You, you fly over South Central and Inglewood. Yep. You fly over Compton, South Central, Inglewood. Yep. That's it. Lenox into the airport. That's how yeah. you know you're almost home. Yeah. That's and then how you, you can know. drive. Around it, yeah, around to get, it. <laughs> to yeah. get home, yeah, which is funny. Yeah, I've I've lived in LA uh, for uh, you know I was right here for mm. ten years or so, never made it to South Central. I maybe once took yeah. the the Compton exit, yeah, because yeah. there's something over there, and I was like, is this? Am I supposed to do that? Like I yeah. still think of it as this thing. Tell dissuade me of that, or tell me. Oh yeah, you what, know what's I think really it's going just, on. You know what I love about it is also just growing up down there in that part of LA is that like, I remember a few years ago when people in doing comedy and like being around this part of town, which is like Los Feliz or Hollywood or East Hollywood or whatever, people talking about like, you know, people who are in the arts will you live in the area. And like, I remember doing comedy out here and there was a discussion years ago about Lady Bird. I, I, I don't remember what the discussion was, which was a good film, yeah. but I just remember it was getting to be a discussion that was like, What's the point of this? And I just thought, you know where I, what I like about where <laughs> I live? What's the point of the movie Lady Bird? No, what's the point of all this discussing it? Oh, you know? I see. And I thought, you know, it's great. Nobody's talking about Lady Bird where I live. And I go, and that's not to say that they don't watch Lady Bird <laughs> or have an appreciation for like independent film. That's great. But they got better shit to think about, you know? You have done it. That is so funny. Yeah. They might be watching Lady Bird, but it's not lighting up the corners. Yeah, it's not lighting up the, you know, it's like, yeah, that's what it is. It's like, that's not to say there's not somebody down there who watches independent film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there yeah. is, you know, but yeah. But, you know, I grew up down there and what I liked about down there, it's like it metaphorically feels 200 miles away. Mm. People have real jobs. Like, you know, my mom's a janitor. It's not like just show busy. Yeah, it's not show busy. And those aspects that feel show busy are people who are like dudes who want to rap or people who went to become athletes. Right. Which you is know? the same for Chicago, yeah. Yeah, Boston, absolutely. New yeah. York. It, yes. it doesn't, it's, it's not, not unique. unique. It's not unique. It, 
it's the one thing that I think is unifying is that like every city has a working class population mm. or a working class section, you know, and that's the one thing that like, you know, I think class can be a unifying thing, especially if you're working class and like, you know what it's like, whether you're white, black, Latino or Asian or Native American, if, if you don't have money to fix your roof, you know, that putting a blue tarp, a tarp over it will yeah. Yeah. stop it from leaking. Right. You know, that's right. It's a band aid. That's you right. Know? So, and yeah. that's a language. It's like, a language. Yeah. yeah. I think it's a language or recycling. You don't recycle for the great of the better of the earth. It's you take your recycling down because you know you're going to get like 30 bucks for it. Yeah. Right. You know? Yes. So, I think I just like those I think recycling in the way you, your attitude towards it yeah. says everything about your class. Yeah. Because yeah. I've said this before in the pod too, but like, the very, very rich people I know are like obsessed with recycling yeah. and doing it properly. Yeah. Because it's one of the few things, it's one of the few like conflicts yeah. that remain. It's like, can you recycle a pizza box yeah. with cheese in it? Yeah. It's like, you know yeah. what, man, we're talking about Ladybird right now. Yeah. Aren't we? yeah. Like, we're this talking about Ladybird. Lady Bird. Yeah. This isn't like a real conversation. Yeah. So, yeah, just kind of instilling those things. But yeah, living down there, it's always been, I don't know, it's, uh, it has its own things, you know, like its own problems, but it also, I, I don't know, I think what I liked about it, especially once I started doing more and more comedy, is that it grounded me in the sense that people didn't care that I did comedy down there. Yeah. You know, or like they have their own things, or even like thinking about my mom, like, you know, she she didn't speak much English and she never, so if she went to go see me stand up, she probably wouldn't understand most of what I'm saying. Oh, wow. Well. You know, so... There's that. Those are those aspects to it that I kind of like. That I'm like, ah, oh, that's freeing. That's more grounding. Like, it's more grounding. Yeah. You know, they don't give a shit. Or I, or sometimes when I hang out with my friends who still live down there, is that you know they either work in construction or they have office jobs or you know maybe they are a teacher or something. But they sometimes they'll be interested as much as they're probably interested in telling telling me me telling them about what I do. They're also interested in telling me what they do right. or, or talking about their kids, right? which is kind of nice because you just go, no, as able to as forget. You know. LA, that's what Rob Riggle said to me when we had our baby. He goes, just remember, nobody gives a shit about your kids. And that's yeah. LA. Yeah. That's not the rest of the world. Yeah, it's not When the, I visit yeah. my friends in Ohio, yeah, yeah they want to hear about your kids. Yeah, LA doesn't give a fuck about your kids because yeah. they can't make any money off of it. Yeah, <laughs> so like with my friends who live in that other part of LA, it's like they care, you know, yeah. or they want to hear that kind of stuff. And Okay, again, I, I'm going to risk being embarrassed because there's just mm. certain feel. Just tell me if I'm way off the mark, but was is there more community? Is there more of a sense of like, this is our neighborhood, this is our... A little bit, I mean... Or no? Yes and no. I think yes in the sense that like when shit goes down, people feel probably attached to their neighbors or people, yeah. you know. So Sometimes you get multi-generational housing where it's like, you know, you get this kind of like where the kids live there with their grandparents and their kids. Yes, and, yeah. you know, so you're seeing people kind of growing up with each other. So is, I think there is that sense of like right. community, you know. So... But also down there, sometimes there's like racial tension, you know, sometimes there's like racial, sometimes there's tension between Latinos and blacks, sometimes there's not, mm -hmm. like sometimes we're the best of friends, sometimes we're not, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. it's all... It's not one thing. Yeah, it's all ebbs and flows, you know, Right. and it's all like, so there's things like of that nature, I think. I just, I think where I'm basing that on, other than movies, mm -hmm. obviously, is, is like, again, I read the book Tribe, please put in the sound of a round of applause here. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> but he talked about, uh, I know Mexico is a different situation, yeah, but course. you'll see the parallel. Mexican people that immigrate uh, to the United States and make more money, often more suicide, more depression. Yeah. And it's it's because like the forced community. Here's another way to, to speak to it in my life. When I was in college and I mm -hmm. lived in the dorms, I was just like kind of, a happier not that not that I am now because it turns out I like being yeah. <laughs> alone a lot but like that forced community time of my life was mm -hmm. bad at times but then it was also good in these yeah, other ways yeah that's what I mean it kind of ebbs and flows you yeah. know or yeah. sometimes there's like you guys are angry about you know there's tension or there's not yeah. and yeah, yeah, yeah I think it it's not flows. but I think people talk to each other more 
yeah. maybe it what to let themselves know that they're either pissed off or or happy. You know? Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. I saw in your stand up you talked about being in a lot of fights. Is that true? You lost uh, a lot of fights. <laughs> yes and no. In the sense that I, in the stand up I talk about, I, I've been in a lot of fights, but I lose those fights. Yeah. You know, because there's like an honor in that. <laughs> Like it, it would just always crack me up because sometimes I would see guys fight and then a guy would, the, the guy that won would lift the other guy up and go, you know what? I respect you because at least you fought me and stuff like that. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What? I, yeah. It makes, it, it makes sense and no sense at the same time. Oh no. I get it both yeah, ways too. I get, I it, get both it both ways. ways. I actually yeah. think it's kind of like, I don't know. Yeah. I don't want to say it's beautiful because it's not beautiful, but yeah. there's something sort of, you know what it is? It's an outside perspective. It's like you yeah. with the junk food. It's like at yeah. least you're noticing, or I'm being codependent with Val, but at least there's an outside perspective. Yeah. So they're fighting, but at least there's an outside perspective yeah. of like, what does this mean? Who yeah. are we? What does it say about yeah. ourselves? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So were you... Well, I think... What I've, was the situation? Were you jumped? No, I've always always, you know, sometimes when you're just like when you grow up in these neighborhoods and there's gangs or there's kind of like, you don't want to be a mark. So sometimes you go, I rather have you kick my ass. I rather us fight and you kick my ass and then just let this happen. Let what happen? Like the stalking, the chasing. Yeah. The, the like punking me or the, or the like, I remember one time I got robbed, like I was like 15, some like gang members from the same high school robbed me. And I just remember being like, they're like, give me your money. And I was like, I, I go, we're just going to have to fight because like, I just remember being like, nah, we're going to get down because I'd rather you whip my ass than me just hand it over. Because then that, it never ends. Yeah. Really? Yeah. So there is that part of it where you just feel, I don't know if it's like a fatalism or like. It seems Machiavellian it, genius yeah. to me as you're like, we can do this in one lump payment Yeah. or you can harass me for 10 years. Yeah. Where it's just one of those things where it's like, you just get so angry that you go, I'd rather you whip my ass than you just take it from me. I'd rather, like, us have to go through this whole thing. Like, you're not going to get it that easy. And also, aren't you kind of calling out that they probably don't want to even kick your... Like, it takes yeah, a lot of energy. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And risk. Yeah. Risk of getting in trouble, risk of getting arrested, risk yeah. of getting hurt. Yeah. I mean, even fu- just pu- beating somebody up yeah. is going to be painful, it's, even yeah. if you're really winning. Yeah. Even if you're not getting hit. It yeah. still sucks to punch so, a yeah. wooden person. Yes, yes. <laughs> like you're basically wood with a little Tempur-Pedic foam on it. So I think there's a little bit of that of like when I was younger like that. Now I would just fuck, if somebody robbed me, I'd just be like, I take it. I don't give a shit, you right. know? But I think when I was younger, you probably have, I'm sure I had this sense of like pride of like being like, I, you know what it was? I remember... This is a really dumb, valuable lesson that I learned when I was young. <laughs> Very dumb, but valuable. One time I was talking shit to my cousin. And I was like 13 at the time. And my cousin had just probably been out of prison. And I was talking shit to him. And out of nowhere, he punched me. And then I was like 12 or 13. And he was a grown man. And he like <laughs> punched me. Knock, he didn't knock me out, but he dropped me. And I remember getting up and being like, you know, angry, crying. Why would you do that? And then he calmly sat me down and said, you weren't expecting that, were you? And I said, no, why would you hit me? We're family, this and that. He goes, okay, see, I'm family and look at what I did. Imagine what somebody who isn't family would do to you. Yikes. And then he said, you shouldn't talk shit to someone unless you're willing to, it, to go somewhere. Like, because they might get you. Yeah, they might get you. That person who you're talking shit to, if you, they might be willing to punch you and you, don't, and you just think you're frivolously talking shit. Right. You know. So it, it might come back to you. It might come back to you. Whoa. So, you know, don't talk shit to, don't berate someone. Right. You know, because I wasn't like arguing with him. I was berating him. Right, right. You know, different. I was calling him a bitch. I was calling him all these things. And it wasn't like I was having an argument because you can argue with mostly anyone. Yeah. It was berating him. Yeah, yeah, I was yeah. literally talking shit. So then he said, look at what I did to you. And I'm your family member and I love you. <laughs> like, he goes, now imagine what somebody who doesn't love you would do to you. Wow. He goes, don't talk shit to someone unless you're willing to take it to the other Level. It took me a, like a day to process that. And yeah. I was like, yeah, I guess he's... I didn't tell him he was right, but I was like, I guess yeah, he's right. Yeah, it was probably too late for <laughs> to say that you were right. Yeah. 
That's interesting. <laughs> what was I just going to say? No, not, not that, but the thing before was, who cares? Let's live in the tension. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was interested in, in more of the neighborhood stuff. Was there a feeling of like, is it is it is the language used? I'm going to get out of here. Is that a part of it, or is no, it? No, because I lived there for a pretty long time, up until yeah. like a few years. I lived there up until like during co- during the pandemic. I moved in with my girlfriend in like in Los. Feliz. And it wasn't with the again. I'm getting this yeah. just from movies. It wasn't like I'm getting out of South Central. It's just where your girlfriend. Yeah, lives. It, it, it. I was just like I'm just. Well, my girlfriend lives in Los Feliz, so I'm just going to move here. I actually, it was never that like I'm getting out of here because I just. Liked where I live. I understood that. Like, yeah, sometimes there's troubles. Yeah. But that's okay. That's what life is. That reminds me of what I was going to say. (laughs) (laughs) When you were like, you're going to have to fight me, you're 15. Yeah. So they're they're trying to rob you and you say, we're going to have to fight. Would that end it? Like you wouldn't be a punk at that point? Yeah, mark, I mean, it, it, would, it, it would probably, most of the time it ended it. It's like this guy's a pain in the ass? It would just be like, he's not an easy... Right. He's not an easy mark. Like It's he's at not least an easy 20 fight. minutes. Yeah, it's going to take some time. <laughs> they kind of like, and it's, they want to rob someone that will give it to them right away because they're scared. And I was scared, but I just at the time was like, I'd rather not, like, we're just going to... I'm not, I don't want, I'm going to feel worse if I just give it to you. Yes. You know. For sure. Yeah. Which maybe in hindsight, it, it's probably just because I'm young and I'm not in control of my emotions like that. Now if someone tried to rob me, I'd be like, yeah. just fucking take it. I don't give a shit. Of course. <laughs> you know? Yeah, no, it's not worth it. I'm not, I would never say yeah. just kick my ass. Yeah. I, or we're just going to have to fight or. Right. You know. I, uh, yeah, in Father Greg's books, there's all these it, it was always, I guess, the randomness of gang violence is yeah. always the most. I don't want to call, it, say it's yeah. the most terrifying thing, but it's yeah. one of the terrifying things. No, it's random. The it's, randomness. Uh, it's randomness, especially if you're not a gang member, right? Because you know, th- from my understanding, being a, growing up with some of those guys in my family, or being around some of those guys just growing up in my neighborhood, it's that they understand. It's not random to them because it's a life they leave they live yeah but it's random to you if you're just walking down the street and somebody robs you or shoots you you know or just says where are you from where are you from and it's like, stuff like but that. you're not from any which means yeah. what gang are you in yeah, yeah and you're not in a gang but yeah. they kind of know you're not in a gang yeah it's just it's like asking somebody like in the 30s got a light yeah and yeah. really they just want to <laughs> kill you yeah. or what time is it yeah or whatever it is and that always yeah uh, chills me yeah did you live in a in a fear yeah. of gangs and that type well, of I think I think if you're street smart, you just go, oh, I know where to go. You live in fear of, like, I don't want to get fucked with, but you just know. How, you learn how to talk to people, too. You know, like, oh, you know, those are those guys and be cool with them. You know, like, right. don't be too meek around them. or know how Oh, to, interesting. So you have to kind of yeah represent as, yeah, as, just as strong. Be, yeah, just don't be too meekish or whatever. But also... There is this sense of like, you're scared of them because they, you know, they can do something and they will do something most of the time. But also sometimes when you have family members that are come from that, it just goes, you kind of know how to talk to them, you know. Mm. So it's just one of those things and, or they feel familiar to you enough or whatever. So interesting. Yeah, but it is, yeah, it is interesting. It's a real dichotomy because I always just to say like, I understand it. It's weird because if you have family members who are gang members, is they represent two things to you. Is that I know they can be scary to you, but they're also loving to me, mm-hmm. and that's complicated. Because mm-hmm. you know, maybe my family member went to prison for killing someone, which I know objectively makes him a bad guy. Mm. But also, I've known him to love me, right? You know, well, that's and interesting. Give me good advice or treat me well. That's Father Greg has a really interesting perspective mm. on that, where he's. It, by the way, we're all different levels of mentally ill. So when yeah. I say mentally ill, I don't mean mm-hmm. or desperate might be another way to put yeah. it. Or I guess you could say misguided. I, he, yeah. usually, he usually says mentally ill, yeah. meaning anybody that killed somebody, that was an act of mental unwellness. Yeah. Meaning yeah. they weren't getting something mm. that they needed. Yeah. Again, I'm not trying I'm not 
trying to be Father Greg. That just helped me to understand, of yeah. course, they're loving in, in these ways. And then there's a deficit the, or some yeah. other thing going yeah, on. Yeah, or another thing going on that, yeah, you just, you know, it's an upbringing that made him that way or personal trauma. Well, that's what he said. It's always, there's yeah. that scale. There's the 10 questions. It's yeah. like, were you sexually abused? Were you neglected? Yeah. Were you drugs? Were yeah. you this? Were you that? And he's like, every gang member he's ever met is eight out of 10 at least. Yeah, yeah, yeah the, absolutely. Which means it, it is an illness, meaning yeah. here's how you catch yeah. this disease. Yeah, and he's which like, is a he's, byproduct of environment, lack of resources, those kind of things. Absolutely. Yeah. So when we say mentally, I'm just trying to be really careful with my words because when you say mentally ill, it's like, well, like the Joker. Yeah. It's like, no, not like the Joker. Like like all of us, like, yeah. like codependency yeah. or, or, yeah. or depression or this yeah. or that. It can manifest in all these different ways. And yeah. that's what I love about those books is it just makes you go like, oh my God. He always says people that join gangs are never running... Uh, to something, they're always running from something. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, the people I know who have been like that, yeah. who have been part of gangs or family members, I knew, I had a feel When I got older and I understand like the complexities of human em emotions, you yeah. go, ah, all right, I see that they were running away from something. Right. They're not like, they're not tough dudes for the sake of being tough dudes. Well, that's dudes. what he says too. He goes, yeah. they're not looking to kill somebody. Most of them are looking to get killed. Like, yeah. He, he, that's deep down. Yeah, unconscious. yeah, yeah. There's a fatal. I re There's something. It's us with yeah. food or, or, or drugs yeah. or addiction. It's a similar yeah. sort of despair. Or uh, I remember one time one of my cousins was going back to prison. And then I said, Aren't you sad? He goes, And he kind of said, It'll be like, Yes, but at the same time, I'll get to relax. Interesting. He goes like, I've been running too crazy out here. I always got to look after my back. Like, right. Look, at, you know, so he goes, I'll be at peace for a bit or something. Interesting. So, and imagine, see, that's yeah. running from something. Yeah, it's running from something. Father Greg also yeah. told that story. He went to some cop seminar about why, like the psychology of a gang member. Yeah. And it, he, there's a pamphlet and it says, mm -hmm. why do people join gangs and you open it? And it says in big letters, excitement. And he goes, I'd make a list of 150 reasons why people join a gang. Excitement wouldn't be on the list. No, <laughs> it's like, but that's imagine. what we think. It's like, yeah. oh, they want to be cowboys or yeah. they're bored. And it's like, no, man, some no. something's really yeah, some let things, them down. Yeah, something's let them down, and it's tough. And yeah, I don't I mean, want to make. But I'm quoting. I just don't want to sound like I understand. Oh no, no, no! I'm but, trying to understand. Yes, and I think that's what it is. I mean, yeah. I think with a lot of those guys, it's sort of that. Mm. That's the one thing we tried to do in the show, which was like, because I was like, how do we got to make these characters feel the comedy doesn't fall on them, right? If you know, because. Anything can be made a joke. I just don't think there's anything too comedic about certain people's trauma. Totally. Unless it's your own trauma and you're making a cathar you're being cathartic about it, which right. I totally get. Right. But like, yeah, it's just finding a way, like, how do you make that the human humanistic backdrop and then the comedy is me and my cousin who butt heads or whatever. Right. Yeah. It's uh, I think that's well put. And going into the show, mm -hmm. I was a little nervous just for you as yeah, as an undertaking. I was like, how do you do this? Yeah. How do you not make it be like Oh, he doesn't. He's stupid. Or, yeah, or he, yeah, yeah. He doesn't understand your references. Or yeah. He resorts to violence too quickly. And yeah. I'm like, pretty sure that's not what's going on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> and then it's just you kind of. They're both similar, very similar people who just have right. similar. It's me with a different zip code. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or a different upbringing. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. So I think it's like yeah, just finding a way to do that, and then even with certain characters, like with. Even the Michael Imperioli character, the, yeah. he's a Unitarian minister, which was a way to, a challenge was to not make him feel like a white savior. Right. And we thought, make him as flawed as everyone else in the show. Yeah. And I thought it, the way yeah. you introduced him was great. Yeah, just make him as flawed as anyone else. Because I wasn't interested in making him a white savior right. character because it feels so demeaning. Or, or even like somebody like... I think sometimes when people paint white liberals on TV, they either pen, paint them as condescending, yeah, or or white saviors in a way that it's kind of patting their backs, their own backs. Sure. And I go, what about these old school lefties 
like that exists, you know, who yeah. are like of the Bernie Sanders ilk, right? Or, you know, yep. who still have an anger to them, right? And then, <laughs> like, I, I thought about Unitarians because my girlfriend grew up a Unitarian, and she told me about going to Unitarian church and these old school lefties that still had a fierceness to them. Yeah, yeah, still yeah. had a fierceness to them, but also seem deeply flawed human beings in the way that everybody is deeply right, flawed. Right. Yeah. I think once you're once you're giving when your life gets that real, yeah. And when you're talking to father somebody like Father Greg, yeah. they're just real about everything. Yeah, they're real about everything. They're, they're living yeah. real life. Because he's seen it all. He's he, seen it all. And he's lo- he's lost people. So and, he's not trying to pr- pretend yeah. to be like the politest or the happiest no, 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 no. or the sweetest guy. You're yeah. just like, oh, this is a real guy. He's a real guy, and I don't think he's waxing poetic. Yeah, you know, it's really cool that. But yeah, I just I don't know. I like working class people. Or I saw this movie called Killer of Sheep years ago that really influenced the show, and it was just about this kind of depressed working class dude, black dude in Watts, and it was I just that idea of like you never see any when you 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 never see entertainment when it takes place in in like places like South Central or those yeah. kind of neighborhoods, somebody be existential. Yeah. Yeah. So wanting to capture some existentialism to the main character. Yes. You know? Yeah. And you also don't see somebody making uh pour over coffee. You know, yeah, like, right? yeah, like yeah. the first shot of the show. <laughs> yeah. But that was also this weird not that it's your job to invite white people to the experience, yeah. but I it is your job to not it in however you choose to do it, to go like, hey, don't forget, there's t- different types of people everywhere. And yeah. that was a very quick way to go. Yeah, they're all the same. They all come from the same place and they're, right. they're, they're both valid. That's they're right. They're both authentic to the place. Right, yeah. but it did make give me a, a bridge to you. Oh, I, I thanks. was like, yeah. I also <laughs> love good yeah. coffee. Yeah, same Okay, here. let's come back. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the show, but also I want to know how you got into comedy. I also want to know if you've ever died, almost died, seen a ghost, seen an alien. Hardest time you've laughed. All that when we come back. Yeah. And I also want to hear a little bit more about those that drug phase you said you oh, went yeah, through. Yeah, yeah. We just kind of gloss past that. But we'll be back in literally two minutes uh, after this. Pardon the interruption, weirdos. This wonderful episode is brought to us by our friend at Mizzen in Maine. No joke. I said, mm, I guess it's and. Mizzen and Maine. I like to say, mm, Maine. Mizzen in Maine are the clothing company that I am most excited about. It is so hard to find clothes when I am touring that are comfortable enough to wear on the plane, that are wrinkle resistant, all of that stuff that are gonna stay looking good, that are warm enough but not too warm, and also look fantastic on stage. I really can't overstate this. I'm not just saying this, I'm not reading it off the monitor. Mizzen and Main makes the best dress shirts and some of the best pants that I've ever owned, but specifically their dress shirts fit fantastic. They have amazing cuts and the fabrics and the patterns and the style are second to none. I've completely done an overhaul. I absolutely, absolutely love them. And the best part is I can fly in the shirt because it's comfortable and I can walk right on stage and I feel and look Great. So the old dress shirts, the rigid ones, the bad ones, they're they're all they all went to Goodwill. I used to dread wearing a dress shirt to do a show or to be on camera, but not anymore. And that's that's really the whole thing. It feels great. What's the first thing you do when you go shopping? You feel the material. And honestly, it's the material that was ruining dress shirts for me until I found Mizzen in Maine. You're not gonna believe it. It's not just another dress shirt from another company. They've completely revolutionized and reimagined the material that you use. I don't wanna say it's athletic, but it's certainly got something to it that's a little bit more give, a little bit uh, more together. It's almost like the dress shirt of the future, but it looks like the dress shirts of the past. <laughs> it doesn't look like them from the past, but it's as good as the ones from the past, but it blends in a little bit of an imp- a, a huge improvement on the material. Because we've all been there. You put on a dress shirt and it makes you wish you were wearing anything else. And that's why you've got to check out Mizzen and Maine, the inventors of the performance that's what I mean by futuristic. The performance fabric dress shirt because there's nothing worse than being uncomfortable and Mizzen and Maine doesn't think you need to be that way. That's why they made the most lightweight, 
breathable and moisture wicking dress shirt on earth. That's what makes it perfect for me for travel, perfect for being on camera, and perfect for being on stage. Because if I'm gonna sweat, I wanna stay comfortable. Their high performance dress shirts are warm in the winter and cool in the summer. Think of your clothing as a secret weapon for any occasion. That's what their clothing is. I'm confident if you give Mizzen and Maine a try, you will never go back to conventional men's clothing again. I certainly know that is true for me. Firsthand, they are actually the best sh dress shirts I've ever owned, and I've felt fabric like this never before in my life. Possibly the best part, they are machine washable. That means no more expensive trips to the dry cleaners. Plus, for cold weather, they've got amazing flannels, pants, sweaters, and jackets made from the same mizzen and main material that they've become famous for. So even if you aren't a dress shirt guy, they've got clothing you need to feel to believe. So... No joke, guys, this is the best fabric, best new shirts that I've encountered. I'm so glad to be working with these guys. And if you give them a try, I promise you're gonna you're making a big mistake if you don't wear Mizzen and Maine. I have a bunch of Mizzen and Maine shirts. They've become my go-to dress shirt. And uh, I think you're absolutely gonna love it. Now I'm just talking from the heart. I'm talking from the heart. So if you want the best cold weather clothing this holiday season, check out Mizzen and Maine right now. If you go to Mizzen and Maine and use promo code WEIRD, you'll receive 25 bucks off any regular price order of $130 or more. That's $25 off when you go to M-I-Z-Z-E-N-A-N-D-M-A-I-N, Mizzen, M-I-Z-Z-Z-E-N, and A-N-D, main, M-A-I-N, dot com, and use promo code WEIRD. Do your wardrobe a favor and show your support of this podcast. Also, this show is sponsored by BetterHelp. We've all had those times in our lives when we wish life came with a user manual, but unfortunately, it doesn't, which is why talk therapy is such a huge, huge help in my own life, and I'm so glad that BetterHelp Online Therapy is bringing us the next best thing to a user manual for life. It doesn't come with a manual, so when it's not working for you, it is totally normal to feel stuck. Navigating any of life's challenges can make you feel unsure, whether it's a career change, a new relationship, trying to get out of a relationship, looking for a relationship, or becoming a parent. Therapists are trained to figure out the cause of challenging emotions and learn productive coping skills, which makes therapy the closest thing to a guided tour of the complex engine called you. And BetterHelp has connected over three million people with licensed therapists. It's convenient and accessible anywhere, 100% online. Therapy, talk therapy has been such a huge, huge game changer for me in my life. As I always say on the show and in these spots, it's greater than the sum of its parts. You'd think talking to somebody would just be talking to somebody, but there's a magic that happens when you're talking to a licensed professional that knows just how to nudge you and guide you and get that conversation and those thoughts rolling in the right direction. It can absolutely transform your life. It certainly has transformed mine. I would not be the person I am today if I hadn't had some incredible therapy. So as the world's largest therapy service, BetterHelp has matched 3 million people with professionally licensed and vetted therapists available 100% online. Plus it's affordable. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to match with a therapist. If things aren't clicking, you can always easily switch to a new therapist anytime. It couldn't be simpler. No waiting rooms, no traffic, no endless searching for the right therapist. Learn more and save 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash weirdo. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash weirdo. All right, everybody, enjoy the rest of the chat with Chris Estrada. And we're back. We're back. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, let's do the drug thing first. What was that? You said you got heavy into drugs. Yeah, just partying with my friends, like. But hard, the, hard stuff. Yeah, like I, there was a friend I there was friends I used to do like meth with and stuff sure. like that, and like I think a lot of it at the time I was just probably had a lot of self hatred, and it was a lot of like, yeah, let's let's do this, so let's see what happens. Where was? But that? I never had a full. I, I don't ever want to paint it like I. I had a full blown addiction. Yes. I felt like I ha I dabbled in that stuff because I just it was like binging on a weekend. I understand. And let's get fucking crazy and it see what happens. It never got its claws in you. Yeah, it never got way. its claws in me because 
I had friends who it, it got their claws in them, mm. you know, and that had a real repercussion to their lives. And in a way, I felt like at the time, I thought maybe I was being a tourist, you know. Right. You felt even at the time. It, it, in hindsight, now I can feel yeah. like, you know, I was. What, what gave you the, so a tourist is somebody that has, you know, you're, you're going deep in the cave, but you have a belay on. You yeah, know, yeah. You have like a rope on you. What was your rope? Like who was kind of, because we're, we're talking about, and relating about some self-loathing, some self-love yeah. issues, yeah. that sort of stuff that, again, I think we all have. But what was anchoring you at that time? You know, I don't know. Maybe a fear, probably a fear of really getting... Just losing. good old-fashioned fear. Yeah, yeah. good old-fashioned fear. <clears throat> I was more of a let's see what, hap- what happens happens, mm. but like more of a... F- I think when you get into it, you gradually go into addiction mm. that like that tunnel i think seems scary to me me too yeah it's funny how some of those dare campaigns when i was a kid like yeah. worked because yeah. like i'll never do snuff because they showed us all the videos of people that had no faces yeah. and i was like oh, i'll never put tobacco so, in my face i, I really i yeah. see people do it i'm like what are you nuts like yeah. i really think it's super <laughs> intense but so when you smoked meth it didn't like light you up in a way that you were like this like just that no you know it's funny it made me go it made me think of the things that i did when i go it made me feel more comfortable and like i'm a piece of shit therefore i'm doing this piece of shit thing oh interesting as opposed to this is making me feel amazing it reinforced it it. reinforced things i think i would often do that i would do things that would reinforce what i felt so you had to start with the problem, yeah, which is the belief that you were a piece of shit. Yes. Did where yeah. did that come from? What what was going on in your family? You know, just always self doubt. You know, just like whatever I had been through in my family, whatever struggles I had, I think I was just kind of like, you know, low self esteem, which is, all things that I think never leave you, but you learn how to cope with or you sure. learn how to fight. Yeah. So I think it was a lot of that kind of stuff. You know. Did your parents split up? Oh yeah, my parents weren't. They weren't together, and then um, I think it was probably that I was always looking for like a father figure too. Like mm-hmm. I would r- try to look for it in books and Bar movies. Bar- John Taffer, yeah, <laughs> John Dad, Taffer. Dad, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then I see you like on the that. show. You have a fake bar, yeah, just to meet him. You're like, yeah, yeah this bar isn't working. Yeah, it's like, Chris, can I see the permits? It's yeah. like, uh. just yell at me. <laughs> yeah, yell at me. <laughs> But I think, I think it was stuff like that that I raised, would go raised by your mom more. Yeah, yeah, raised by my mom, my grandma, stuff like that, you know. But I also, I think it's just also probably just what I think is probably cl- clinical depression. Yeah, you know, yeah, stuff like that. Always, always. What was I telling my friend the other day? I said it's hard when you have to, you spend your whole life thinking you're you're sad because, and you think, well, I must be a poet. Yeah, that sees the world differently. Yeah, and then you just find out ah, something's actually just wrong with you. Yes, <laughs> it's not that you're a poet. Your brain makes the wrong cocktail. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, a little too much of this, not enough of that. Not enough of that. Yeah. yeah. And did that draw you to comedy? Like, when did comedy come into your life? I think movies and comedy always came into my life, and as a as a way to just like. You know, latchkey kid, my mom would let me rent movies all the time or I'd be at the library. So I think just even like arts, like whether it was like punk rock music or films Mm -hmm. and TV, I think the first comedy I really enjoyed was probably like, you know, staying up to watch Conan or Saturday Night Live or like, you know, or whatever like Mexican comedies that I knew about or whatever. And then... But I, I didn't start stand-up till I was like, I started at 29. Really? Yeah. I'm 38 and I started at 29. Wow. And it was just... I wonder if there's an advantage to that, though. You kind of yeah. came in a little bit more formed as a person. Probably. I think, you know what it was, too? It was also like, I started late because I think for a long time, I just was scared of taking that leap, you know? And I think sometimes with being so much into art, it's you start vicariously living through other people. 
Interesting. Do you as know a what fan. I mean? Yeah. As a fan. It's one of the reasons I'm a terrible fan. Yeah. Like, that's why I, go, I sit down to your show to be like, let's see what this piece of shit yeah. That's again, unconsciously. No, but that's... But I'm not great at museums. Yeah. I'm not great in audiences. But, but that's the thing is sometimes I think even with like that punk stuff, I would go... I love the philosophy so much of... I became more of a f- fan of the philosophy of DIY. I was going to say DIY. Why? Well, and yeah. you, it doesn't matter if you're not good, just start and you'll get good. Yeah. Like I was probably more of a fan than I was a practitioner of it. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. And I think a lot of that had to do with like low self-esteem. And I remember one time telling a girlfriend that I wanted to try stand-up and she said, that's for losers. And I went, you're right. <laughs> I did it. Oh my yeah. God. I go, that makes a lot of sense. And then I didn't do stand up for like. But she was, she's yeah. not wrong. It's for people who have lost. Yeah. It is. It yeah. is for people and who it's have funny. lost. When I, when I started stand up, I had just been fired from a job. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So she and was I got then, good at stand up after my first wife left me. It's yeah. like, it is for losers. She's yeah. absolutely yeah, right. She's right. Yeah. And thank God there's yeah. something for us losers. Yeah. To I just, do. At, the, at that point, I didn't want to be a loser to her yes you know but turns out you actually did want to be a loser yeah. to her like yeah because that is the risk we're back to what we were saying about stand up at the beginning like yeah. making little origami shapes yeah. out of your feelings is yeah. very i you know i don't want to say frou-frou or whatever the word yeah. is but it, it's similar to painting a landscape yeah it is. but we want it to look like rock yeah. and roll it's not yeah it's, it's, it's it and can be both i guess i think it was you know yeah, just getting through all that, like getting to stuff like that. I became such a fan, but what was good, I think it it informed me. You know, I I liked stand up much way before I ever started it. Who did you like? Um, Colin Quinn, I was a big right. fan of. Greg Giraldo. Oh wow! You know Maria Bamford, Dave Attell, mm-hmm. uh, stuff like that that I would listen to. That I was like, this is great. But also at the same time, I liked movies, and I was familiar with people who wrote movies and but it also seemed like so impenetrable to me that I was like well I'm, I don't know I'm just a working class guy from this neighborhood I I don't know how you do it but I think what was great about starting stand up is that stand up is not impenetrable there's yeah. literally an open mic yeah that it's open come. It's open. The yeah. first word is open. Yeah. The second <laughs> word is the thing you hold. Yeah. That's absolutely <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Even the name kind of tells you what to do. It's exactly. Get that yeah. mic. <laughs> yeah. Get the mic. <laughs> so I think a lot of that was that. And then, but yeah, I think getting into, you know, comedy and, and film and TV and stuff. Where like did that. you perform first? If I remember correctly, one of my first open mics was at this. It was. It's no longer around. Or it's, the building's still there. It was a club in in South Central in Lamert Park. It was called Maverick Flats. Okay. It was a mostly like a black comedy club night that they would have there. And I lived close by, so I just said, "I'm gonna go do it." And then I did it. It, it was mostly all comedy. Uh, all stand up. Yeah. They okay. used to have this like. Uh, I think I went the night they used to do it almost like Apollo style. Is that they would slam their keys on the table or ring their keys once they wanted you off? Oh no! Yeah, so I did that, and then I think that might have been my first one. Oh, yeah. oh no! <laughs> yeah. Oh no! Never give the audience a mechanism with which to unifiedly. Yeah, I know. Tell you you're done. Yeah. They give you the light. Yeah. I got the keys. The I gotta yeah. go. I'm getting they would the keys. their keys. The jingle them the is like, I kind of want you to go. Yeah. <laughs> Banging them is like, really, you got to go? Yeah. Yeah. And was there like a a pressure to do more like bolder stand-up? Like, because you yeah. watch the Apollo, you kind of attack the stage. I or think, at least attack with your personality, like go big yeah. or or go confidently at least. I think it was for me probably to go confidently and also go colloquial. You know, yeah, sure. I go, well, I live here and I bet if I can write jokes about where I live, they, okay. they're they local to here. Yeah. So that'll hit, yeah. you know. And I think I did I did okay enough to go, I should do this again. You didn't and get the keys. I, did, I, I got the keys like three minutes in. Three minutes pre-keys, uh, pretty good. Yeah, so it's not bad, you know. And then... I love 
But yeah, that <laughs> you, okay. you wrapped it up. You're looking at your set list. And if I get the keys here, that'll be my closer. Yeah. <laughs> but if, if I keep going, kind of hope I get yeah. the keys before this bit because I don't really have an ending yeah. to it. <laughs> but, you know, stuff like that. But I, I, like you said, I mean, it's for loser. I remember like wanting to start before. Like, I remember I used to, I was telling someone the other day that I'm bad at like picking up signs. Like, you know, when people, like I was, remember I was talking to this young woman, she was, a, she's an actor and she told me one time she came out and she just got like quit her job and then she saw like, she was in New York and she saw like this matchbook for acting school or something. She knew that's the sign that I have to follow, that I have to go. I go, no. good, good for you because I was always bad at like picking up, like I I used to work at an animal hospital. Uh, and the dog went, stand up comedy. <laughs> and, you're like, and I was like, nah. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. But my Shut job up. was to work outside and um, look over the parking, the, the parking spaces and to pick up dog shit. And I remember one time my finger poked through the bag and went into the dog shit. And then I, instead of taking that as a sign that I should quit this job, I remember saying like, like I remember crying, like going up to the roof and just being like, what am I doing with my life? Because I was like 25 or 26 at the time. And then being like, what am I doing with my life? Or like I had dog shit in my finger, this and that. And then I go, <laughs> this is, I'm never going to do this again. And then I went back the next day and I worked there for like another seven months. And I'm like, I just knew I'm like bad at picking up. I wish that was the moment that I started stand up. Oh my God. Yeah. And it's too late. Yeah. You've told the story. Yeah. <laughs> you, can't, you can't go back and be and like, and that's when I, I did my first was, open mic. And I went that night. Nah, no. I just. Seven months. I think I worked it for like seven more months. Dude, it's also yeah. kind of, it's, it's in the same ballpark as codependency because I remember having a girlfriend, uh, the same girlfriend, mm. and being like, I got to break up with this person. I forget. She did something yeah. that was very mean or something like that that I perceived to be mean. I went in, in the shower, which was the only place I was ever alone uh, because we were always yeah, together. Together. So I took a sh like an invol like a unnecessary shower just to yeah. kind of think it through. Yeah. I was like, I, I think that's it. Like it was w a bridge too far. We got to break up. It was seven months later. Yeah. <laughs> seven months later. But little did she know she was dating someone yeah, that someone was like. Was waiting. Any uh, minute any now. Minute now. <laughs> seven, like months. vacations together. I don't mean like big trips. Yes, of course. I just mean like, like going up to places yeah. like with someone who was like, I made up my mind seven months ago. Yeah. That's like, I say it anytime it comes up. You, if anyone's listening and they're doing that, that's meaner than just breaking up oh, with somebody. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. you learn that. Yeah, you learn, learn that. that. Don't leave it took me on. a while. Emily Gordon, I think, was the one yeah. that was like, that's your bit about open relationships. That's like serial killer stuff, your yeah. bit. But also, like, just knowing you're going to break yeah. up with somebody yeah. but being like, but I'm kind of bored. Yeah. Just kind of, like, stick just, around. Just deal with your feelings. Exactly. Yeah, just deal with your feelings. I wasn't even bored. I was terrified of breaking up with her. That was more the issue. Like, I, I knew she would, and she didn't. It yeah. took 10 tries. Well, sometimes I would make a situation. I was be in those relationships where I didn't want to be the bad guy, so I would make things not work so they would break up with me. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, and then be like, God, I'm not... Yeah, I'm, I'm not, not a breakup person. Yeah. I got dumped. Yeah. I listen to Radiohead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly, yeah. that's for me. Yeah. Um, all right, well, that's that's comedy. I love the keys thing. Have you ever almost died? Yeah, I feel like I have. Um, well, when I was 17, I think 17 or 18, me and my friends got shot at. No. Yeah, got shot at in my neighborhood where my mom, right by where I was living at the time in Inglewood. And there was a, we were coming back from the beach and this guy was like trailing us, like once we were back in my neighborhood. And everybody, we dropped my friend off and this guy just came out of his car and started shooting at us. Well, and I think he was like high or something, like he must have mistaken us for someone, you know, like it was happening randomly, but I felt like with an intent that I go, I. He thinks we're someone else. Right. You know. Right. And then. How old were you? 17. 17 oh, or 17, 18. Yeah. I was 17 or 18. And it's, then. It's not, you don't want to run from gunfire and flip flops. Yeah. Coming no, back no, from, no. The, coming back yeah. from the beach. Sand. Yeah. And then <laughs> we just like hopped back in the car and then took off. But I, he shot out one of my friend's back windows. And then. So I was, that was one of the few times I, I came close to that. 
and See, then you know in movies the back window always just shatters and yeah. it's like oh glad that's done but that means the bullet's in the car yeah <laughs> you know what I mean? yeah. it didn't just hit the window no like i just caught myself being like well thank god i hit that window no yeah. it went in the car like it, it could have got yeah. you guys that's terrifying and then that happened i think you know a lot of the things that i felt like i didn't think about it but now in hindsight i can tell go oh, i almost died like one time I was at the I was at a gas station. I went to go p- pump gas for my mom, mm. and I got held up at the gas station. Oh, no. I was able to talk myself out of it. What do you mean? Like you this, talk the person out? Yeah. Of it? Well, the guy he he held me up, and then he had a gun pointed at me, and then he said, "Give me your money," and then I gave him what I had in my in my wallet, which was eight dollars, but in my pockets I had fifty bucks. And then the old pocket wallet. Yeah, <laughs> and then and he in was my sock. I had seventy five hundred on. <laughs> he asked me for his for my wallet, and I said, "How are you gonna take my wallet?" And I had a picture of the uh, Virgen de Guadalupe, the Virgin, the Mexican Virgin Mary, and I showed it to him. I said, "How are you gonna take this?" I know, like, and then did like, he, what did he say? And then he, I, he looked at me, and he he just went, he smacked my hand, and he said, "Man, fuck you!" And then he got in his car, and then eight dollars. But what I thought was, I go, you know, I know that was a loaded pistol. Like he could have, in hindsight, I go, he yeah, probably totally. Could've, he could have give him the Virgin Mary. Yeah, I should have just <laughs> given it to him. <laughs> you know what it was it. though? That wallet, the stuff that was in that wallet, my grandma had given to me, and she had recently passed. Yeah. So I was just kind of like, ah, I don't want to do part with this. You're making me realize I've always thought I have like a, a clip wallet that mm-hmm. if somebody robbed me, I would try to remove the money. Yeah. Like in like a David Copperfield because I just don't want to replace all this. Yeah, stuff. <laughs> you don't want to. What re- are you gonna do with my ID? Yeah, come yeah, on, what? man. I think it's just it's quicker. You know, give me you your wallet. Give the wallet. That's where your debit and credit card is or whatever. Right. Yeah. So wow. I feel that. Let's I see. can't believe you had the wherewithal to be like, come on, man. It's my wallet. I think I was so like in the my grandma had just passed, so the minute there was literally like a Virgin Mary little card photo she put in there, and oh, I was she gave it to you. She gave it to me, so oh, I was wow. just like, this is my, "I'm not gonna give you my fucking wallet. You got my money." Eight you know? bucks. That's a bold thing to say after handing a thief. I eight, mean, I should have just given him the fifty bucks in my pocket, you know. But I wasn't even thinking that. Right. I was just well, the adrenaline. Like, your heart had yeah. to be racing. I mean, yeah. we can talk about it casually, but. Mm-hmm. Nobody with a gun pointed to yeah. them is, is uh, relaxing. And then one time when I was 10, 10 or 11, me and my friend, this kid Hector Soto, we used to go to this comic book store. I know Hector. That, yeah, you know Hector Soto. <laughs> it was it was a comic book store on the border between Inglewood and South Central. It was called the CBC, the comic book club. This older, like really sweet, older black nerd named Earl used to run that comic Earl. book store. And... Um, we were in there when it got robbed at gunpoint oh, and no. and the guy took money and what was funny is he took a few comic books too that were like on the wall i don't think he oh, like expensive ones yeah he just correlated with those are expensive valuable and valuable and then I, you know he pointed the gun at us and everything in hindsight you know i i know now that like in everything goes by so quickly but i know in those situations He's scared. Not, he's scared. He's scared. Yeah. And I'm not saying that 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 he he I'm not justifying his actions because he's a shitty no, person for doing that. Yeah, of course. Yeah. But you're keeping in mind that he's still a person. Yeah. He does there's a great Bruce Eric Kaplan car- cartoon. He dressed for the New Yorker, and it's yeah. a guy robbing a couple, and the you know, the bank the robber, he's not yeah. a bank robber, the thief has a thought bubble and it says, God, these things are always so awkward. Yeah. And I'm like what I like about that cartoon yeah. is he's not suddenly a thief. He's some guy yeah, some named guy. Steve yeah. who likes this type of ice cream and and took how many poops did he poop yeah. that day? And yeah. When did he go to sleep? And like, what's his favorite movie? Yeah. And then he goes in. It's not like central casting no. thief. He's a guy. Yeah, he's a and guy. his heart is jacked, and he's scared, yeah. and he's worried. Anything happen? He could get hurt. Yeah. All that sort of stuff. Yeah, he could get hurt. And then so as I got older, I understood like, oh man, he could have. Uh, people die that way by accident, yeah. you know, by being scared. Yeah. Some, you know, think about what your cousin said. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So those are the three that come to mind. Those situations. I love that you're just like those three times that I was at gunpoint come to mind. 
I'm like, wow, my, my question doesn't seem so cute anymore. <laughs> Have you ever almost almost bit it? You're like, bit it. well, three or four times I was shot at. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever seen not just a ghost or a UFO, but anything that you can't explain? Yeah, I I feel like I have, especially like with my family being like, like Mexican Mexican people are superstitious, and then my grandma used to do these. Um, they're called limpiezas in in Spanish, but they're like literally when somebody has like a like um, they're not feeling well, they have bad energy. They call it mal de ojo or the evil eye or whatever, mm -hmm. like. Sometimes my grandma would give us spiritual cleansings with eggs. Like egg yolks or eggs? Eggs. Okay. And then crack the egg yolk. Oh. And, to and like get rid of it. To get rid of it. And maybe it's a placebo in that you, I, you would feel better afterwards. Yeah. And stuff like that that but I like go. Like intent. Is, like, there's strong evidence for intent yeah. and like and your thoughts yeah. changing Stuff reality. like that. And yeah. then I remember... When my grandma died, she 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 lived here, but she died in Mexico. You know, it's really crazy. I was really close to my grandma, and she, when she was going to a trip to Mexico where she's from, and like a week before she left, she we were talking, and she said, "I'm gonna go die there." Mm. And I said, "Don't talk like that." But I just thought you're just being old and crazy, you know. Yeah. And she goes, "No, no, no, I'm gonna go die there. It's it's fine." She goes, uh, your earth calls, you, your land calls you back. Wow. You, it's, you know when your land is calling you back. And sure enough, she went and she died there. And I remember she said, make sure they bury me there. Like, don't bring me back here. Mm. And then they buried her there. But I just remember her being so sure of her, like, that she's going to die there. Your land calls you back. Yeah, and she always said, your land calls you back. So there was, there was something so, like... Mm, mystic about that wow. to me. And, so. like, and we buried her here in South Central. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's buried at the Inglewood Cemetery. <laughs> we yeah, respected we not, none of no, our rules. Zero. Yeah. Zero. Your land calls you back. Yeah, but these plot prices yeah. are a lot I was cheaper. like, I'm not going to fly but fly it once a year to give you. No, no, I'm going to drive to the Inglewood Cemetery and leave you flowers. <laughs> Let's it's, keep this simple, yeah, please. It's more expensive to take you back to the U.S., but it'll pay in the long haul because I don't want to pay for flights. <laughs> To Mexico once yeah, a year. Yes, yes. <laughs> Your grandson flies you back. <laughs> yeah. So we, uh, so stuff like that. I That's feel beautiful though. And then I feel like I don't know. I feel like I believe in ghosts in the sense that, like, in terms of an energy and like where you go. So, this place feels eerie or sure. things of that nature. Any connection to your grandmother since she passed? Any sort of feeling? This is usually where the lights flicker. No, yeah, <laughs> it is. Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah. Um, it goes stand up comedy. It's the dog. Yeah. It's a dog trying to reach yeah. you. It's trying to give me a, a shelter. A sign. You yeah. put your finger in my poop. Whoa, there he is. It took you that long to start stand up. <laughs> he doesn't yeah. believe it. Yeah, seven months. months? Yeah, <laughs> um, I would say. I've had a few dreams about her. Oh, know. I don't want to force it. Yeah, no, no, but you, no, no. But you like do dreams, a little bit. Yeah, yeah, dreams. Yeah, I've had dreams about her. I think soon after I had dreams about her. But Isn't it weird that dreams are just visions that were just yeah. like, yeah, but they don't count because everybody has yeah. <laughs> eight hours of dream visions every yeah. night. It's like it's still an incredible phenomenon yeah. that your brain is like conjuring up these images. It is really crazy. The weirdest one I ever had, which was not a dream, but this when my grandma died, there, um, she used to tell me about the, you could hear like, so there's the part of Mexico where they were from, there were a lot of battles with, you know, native Mexicans and the Spanish and, mm -hmm. you know, or, and stuff like that. And there used to be this thing, or at some point, I guess a lot of Apaches immigrated to this place where they're from called Zacatecas. So she said that years ago, she told me that you would hear, you could hear their war cries. Oh wow! You could hear their war cries sometimes. And when I when she died there, we I went down there, and then I was we were staying at a uncle like her brother's place, uh, waiting the funeral and everything. And one night I heard something, and I woke up my mom, and I was like twenty at the time, and she said, "I said, what is? Do you hear that?" And she goes, "Go to sleep. Those are the Apache war cries because the, they say Apaches had immig immigrated there." And so that always stayed with me. The fact that I. 
I don't even remember because I remember asking my mom, hey, mm. do you remember that last night? And she didn't. Mm. So either it was a dream mm. or it was reality. My mom just went, yeah, it's this, you know. So it would have been ghosts, right? I mean, it, yeah, yeah, it's it not like there's ghosts. reenactments. Yeah, it's not, no, it's not. Yeah, it's not reenactments. <laughs> I went straight to like, yeah. oh, like Civil War reenactments. Yeah, reenactments there's the yeah. Apache <laughs> reenactments. And yeah. they were doing it in the middle of the night, yeah, which is pretty normal. <laughs> I love that she's like, Oh, don't worry. It's just ghosts. Go back to bed. Yeah, that like, was her. Th- yeah, it was. I don't know ghosts. why, but that is the most like Mexican. Like the yeah. way you're saying Mexican superstitions. Yeah. Like relax. relax. It's just it's ghosts. It's just a ghost. Yeah, it's just a ghost. <laughs> Which is, would have been very on point for my mom too. Yeah, because my mom always. She, one time I heard her like cussing, and like I got home and she said, "I'm like what?" She goes, "I felt there was bad spirits around." So my mom too, in order to like. She scared him off. Yeah, she said, you got to sc- scream. My mom's reaction to ghosts is anytime you feel there's ghosts in your house, just yell at them and go, you stupid motherfucker, we don't want you here. Get out of here. Wow. <laughs> um, exorcism. <laughs> yeah, um, exorcism, yeah. <laughs> that was really funny the way just to hear her say, like, that's how you deal with ghosts, you know. It's not any romantic ritual where you call her a priest. Or <laughs> no. You, no, no holy water. Yeah. Just tap water and yeah. swear it. Yeah, and just yell at them <laughs> and tell them that you don't want them in your house and, and it to works. leave. Yeah, and it, works. it works. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, okay. <laughs> La- last. Oh, we didn't talk about the meaning of life. Is there any sort of? Oh, fr- I forgot the meaning of life. Mm-hmm. Do you have any framework, any any religious or spiritual bent? You, you mentioned ghost energy, yeah. spirit. You know, I grew up Catholic, and even though I don't believe in that stuff anymore, I think Catholicism is so much symbolism. Like it's a lot of symbols of and course. saints and all that stuff. So it gives me a comfort. Even though I don't believe in that stuff, it gives me a comfort to see it. Mm-hmm. Like I have a rosary hanging from my rearview mirror. Okay. Yeah, I have a Virgin Mary air freshener. <laughs> so like, fantastic. So those kind of things, I, I don't even know. I don't believe in Catholicism or, or most. I don't guess I don't believe in God in that traditional, like religious way anymore. But the images have meaning for you. Yeah, I also just think they remind me of people. Like it reminds me of my grandma. So it's nice to keep those things around. Yeah, you know. I get but, that. but I just. Yeah, I, the imagery, and I guess that's what imagery is supposed to do, or those symbols are supposed to do. They're supposed to evoke a feeling or sure something. And even even like behind your thinking mind, I guess we could just yeah. say unconsciously, the Virgin Mary is a reminder that life can come from a void, meaning yeah. there's no conception, but here's life. Yeah, and that is also what the Big Bang theory yeah. is: is that there was a void and then life came yeah. out. Yeah. And it's also what Santa Claus is. It's like yeah. gifts come from an <laughs> yeah. unseen, unseen force. Thing, so yeah. we love symbols that say like, don't forget there's something that doesn't make sense yeah. but is going on behind the scenes. Yeah. And we don't even have to, I just intellectualize it, but we don't even have to intellectualize it. You might just love Christmas. Yeah. You, you might just love uh, something that reminds you of your grandmother. Yeah. But, you know, your grandmother was a miracle. Yeah. And so are yeah. you, and anything that reminds you of that stuff and t- taps you in. I think now I just look at things like more of like, I think life is mysterious and and also like a behind, I guess it's a substitute for God, but the idea of a life force. Sure. You know, like I just go, ah, it's... The great life. Yeah, the great life. Yeah. That's what I, I, I found Things myself saying like a force. That to Leela's of the, my daughter is of the age where she'll say, why, why, why? Mm-hmm. And we were talking about death. We, she calls death bones, which I think oh, is so funny. Wow. She goes, oh, then it becomes bones. Or we saw. So, that's so poetic. I know. Children are poetic. It becomes way, bones. Man. She also sometimes says, are we here yet? And I'm yeah. like, are we? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why. I think that's yeah. really great. And also, a, a bird, unfortunately, birds fly into our windows. Uh, from time to time, we put bird seed on it and we we taunt them from the other side mm-hmm. of the glass just to kill them. I'm just kidding, <laughs> but they're always dying. So she sees birds uh, dying, and she's like, "Where's where? What happens to the bird?" She didn't say it in yeah. those terms, and I just caught myself saying, "Like, it goes back into the great life." And I was like, "Yeah," <laughs> like, yeah. You know, like I had to reduce it to something that maybe Lila would yeah. understand without making her too irreverent of her own survival. Yeah, but I was like, "You go back into the great." So when you 
West Coast hippies, LA people, California people get a bad rap for talking about a life energy, and I, I, I can understand that. Or yeah, open toed sandals and that sort of thing, or a, the force. But it's like I always like to share this point that the God of the Bible, which is the one that um, most people or a lot of people in this country, yeah. I hear to believe. Yeah, it. I was going to say fuck with, but yeah. 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 <laughs> Remember, <laughs> God says to Moses, I am that I am. So he's talking about I am amness, yeah. I am being, yeah. meaning I am the source of being. I'm a life force. Yeah. So it's it's the same same yeah. thing. Life force just sounds more like the internet, like, yeah. like electric. Or something. I one time heard, I saw this documentary on Joe Strummer, the singer of The Clash, mm -hmm. and he had this great quote that always stays with me. He was at a concert. And he took a moment to say say this to the crowd. And he says, don't forget that we're all alive at the same time. Mm. We're all alive right now at the same moment. And isn't that amazing? Yeah. And I just go, yeah, that is <laughs> like, it gives me a sense of like, wow, what a, That's it's it. uncom, it's, I can comprehend it and not at the same time. Absolutely. Yeah. I remember Emily Maya Mills did some mm -hmm. strong psychedelic at a party and I said, what did you do? She she didn't realize. I think she didn't realize what it was. And she just kept looking at people and going, we're here. We're here. And yeah. I was like, that's what Joe yeah. Strummer is yeah. saying. And honestly, that to me is a, the big difference between a good day and a bad day is mm -hmm. did we remember to remember? Did we remember yeah. that we're here? Yeah. And this conversation that we're alive at the same time. Yeah. There'll be a time when we won't be alive. Yeah, yeah. That's and exactly it. I was sitting on the porch waiting for you and I was just breathing and I was like, isn't it weird you know, like meaning mindfully breathing. I was like, isn't it weird that like someday another breath would be like the thing I want the most? Yeah. And I was like, yeah. not today though. Today it's just one million, one like yeah. of, the, of, the, of the day. Like, it is really something else to, I guess, be alive and experience. And being conscious. And being conscious and uh, experience. Uh, of yeah. yeah, of it, of the complexities of human emotions that you're going to feel Yes, like, you know, whether it's like happiness or sadness, loss or wins, and like, yeah. and and it's not a lot of them aren't that binary. Yeah, you know, that's right. They're like a lot of them aren't that happy. Binary. Sad is a, is a thing. Yeah, happy sad happy is a sad thing. Is a thing. Yeah, you know, or like happy loneliness. Yeah. you know, not to project onto you, but uh, this fool got season two. That's mm. like happy, and also like we gotta, you know, there's yeah, like it's a, an overwhelm. Gotta, it's dreadful. Yeah, in a way. Yeah, you know, it, it is. Like making another season of TV that you've done before is like, wow, I feel very lucky to. And oh my God, I'm fucking terrified. Yeah. It's a lot of work. I didn't intend on doing this, but for me, the second season of Crashing was really difficult because mm. the first one has all of this energy of like, I can't believe we're making the show. Yes. And the second season, for me, if you're not conscious, meaning every morning going like, we're alive at the same time. The show is just an excuse to hang out yeah. with your friends, with the writers, with the actors, with the mm -hmm. crew. It's a it's a special opportunity and to be grateful. All of those things, if you don't do those things mindfully, to me, the feeling was like, we just did this. Yeah. Like it's another season and and more story. Now it can start to feel like a grind. You you mm -hmm. lose your footing. Yeah. So I'm not saying that to you for any reason other than you're oh. in the unique position. I have to stop myself from being that way because yeah. I... Because I well, we're often, wired the same way. Yeah, You're I often, often go. This is now a burden. It's yeah. a blessed burden, but it's a burden, yeah. and it it makes me feel bad because in hindsight, I go, "Why didn't I take more pictures?" <laughs> like, yeah, you know, or yeah. like, why didn't I do that? But I guess I I always look at things like incremental wins or I, incremental goals. Yeah, I don't look at like, wow, the fact that I'm making this TV show is where I want to be. Because I didn't, I didn't start stand up comedy for those reasons. I just go, wow, this is a new goal to take on, and yeah. then whenever that is done with, move on to whatever the next goal is. You yeah, know? yeah, that's right. Yeah, but it is amazing, you know. And I, but I think I get so, you know, you get so perfectionist about things, and you want to make. Well, maybe we should be talking about it because yeah. I mean, a lot of people are going to project onto you a lot of happiness and fulfillment that you may not be feeling. Yeah, because, yeah, because you're like. So what Larry David qu quitting Seinfeld? He was yeah. like, I just don't want. I can't think of any more stories. It's yeah. driving me crazy. Yeah. So you have to like give yourself, or everybody needs to give themselves permission to feel how they're feeling. Yeah. But I would say what fixed it for me in the third season mm -hmm. was having a, a. I don't mean like necessarily it was a spiritual practice, but like a, just a routine of going like 
just today, just these scenes. Yeah. The mantra, it's just an excuse to hang out. Yeah. Is like was really powerful for me. That's great. Instead of thinking about the edit and thinking about how it's gonna yeah. be received, how it's gonna be reviewed. Is this story stupid? It's just like, man, this is an excuse to hang out. Yeah, you know, yeah, and have fun and create. Yeah. Yeah. And and not just how lucky are we, but like how lucky are we all? Yeah. You know, you, you see somebody you know at a coffee shop, that's also as lucky. Luck is luck is luck. Yeah. Good is good is good. Yeah. So like uh I guess I am just trying to encourage you to be like feel how you feel and don't don't believe it when people are like, wow, you're doing the second season, man. Whoa, yeah. man. <laughs> yeah. Projecting onto yeah. you how they think they would feel. Yeah. When uh-huh. in reality, they probably feel like how you feel, which is yeah. more than one emotion at the same yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. And that's, yeah. I find things are always that, you yes. know. They're not a binary or they're not just one thing. It's like, it's they're both exciting, uh, boring, sad, angry, all at the same time. Yeah. Fucking A. Yeah. <laughs> Love that. Um, well, thank you, Chris. Thanks for having me, Pete. There is one more question. Yeah. And then I ask you 50,000. Like, no, 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 no. Good. Just one more. Um, can you think of a time in your life you laughed really, really hard? And, and, and that's where we'll get out. And I always like to give these caveats. It doesn't have to be a great story. Yeah. Just like maybe you're a kid. Mm-hmm. Maybe it was recently with a friend. Maybe you were on drugs. It doesn't matter. Somebody fell down. Somebody farted, pooped their pants. Yeah. Just if you were laughing to the point of tears, who are you with? How old are you? What happened? Jeez, I'm trying to think. Things that really make me laugh like that. You know, sometimes I I shit my pants in front of my girlfriend like <laughs> like like about... God, maybe a year ago, what? like <laughs> in front of her. Yeah. Well, we went out for a hike, and then I'm lactose intolerant, oh, and I have like IBS. Yes. And we went over into Penga Canyon, and I had to go to the bathroom. There was nowhere to go, so I didn't shit my pants, but I had to shit on the trail, and I felt such like a awful. bear. Yeah, I like felt so. I felt so embarrassed because I'm very self conscious about bathroom stuff. Like, oh no, we play. I play music when I go to the bathroom. I don't. Sure. You know, I'm very self conscious about bathroom. Dude, I'll stuff. put my earbuds in so I don't hear myself. Yeah, the airport. yeah. It's not just for the other people. Yeah. I'm like, I don't want to hear me. Yeah. So I do all that, and then I, and it wasn't until a day later I was just like, I just I wasn't even with my girlfriend. I was by myself, and then I started laughing about. Me should, and the point that I started crying after the fact, yeah, after the fact, where I just went because I felt such dread. I went home, I took a shower, I went to sleep. You I didn't want to see you her. Burnt the outfit. Yeah, <laughs> you went to sleep. I went to sleep. You had to shut it down. Like yeah, a laptop. I had to shut it down. Like, shut yeah. it down. I can't yeah. feel this. So I think, that, I think laughing at the ridiculousness of having to do that, and I think my girlfriend trying to be comforting to me. And yeah. the last thing you want is anyone to talk to you after you have to do that, you know? And I think she kept saying, like, don't worry, this is better. We've been together for six years. It's better that this happened now yes. than the first year of six dating. Six years is the poop anniversary. Yeah. <laughs> There's paper, wood, yeah. copper, poop. <laughs> poop, yeah. <laughs> so I think, like, a day, it was two days after that I started just, I was thinking about it, and it just made me laugh. Of so course. Much. Did me, you me. try for a nature wipe or did you just go natural? Dude, I didn't even think of that because I've never been in that situation. And we had, I had literally had one napkin left and I used the napkin. And it wasn't until afterwards where I told my friend, he goes, why didn't you use one of your socks? One of your socks. That's a man who's pooped on a trail yeah. before. <laughs> and then I just thought, why didn't I use one of my socks? Because... Yes. There's no way I was clean. Don't buy a brown sock. That's what we always always said. I love that. Thank you for sharing that story. I also, is there a better meaning to coping with life? Shitting on a trail, you don't want your girlfriend even comforting you, Mm, get out of here, you go home and shut it down. And then a few days later or whatever it was, you've had time to process it. And those things become the biggest laughs. Well, what made me laugh about it is I just kept thinking, I was like, it made me laugh because I go, she has sex with me. And then I just go, and I'm I'm like shitting myself, you know? Like it just made me laugh where I just go, 
I go, that's so disgusting. Like, that's I just go, so funny. it just made me laugh because I go, I would never be with someone like that. <laughs> Not if that was your first date. Yeah. But six years, she's right. Six years, she's, yeah. Six years. I, Val wouldn't mind me saying, we were coming back from the Vegas airport and she was, had morning sickness. Mm-hmm. And so she puked on, outside of the Vegas airport. And while she was vomiting, we both like had a mind meld and we're like everyone at this airport thinks she's hung over because oh, it's yeah. a Vegas airport. Of course, yeah. And I'm like, you want to scream like she's pregnant. pregnant. Yeah. They're like, well, she shouldn't be drinking like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Chris, I, I just had a feeling I would like you. I'm, uh, I'm thanks. Man. I really enjoyed you. Thank you. You're super funny. You're one of a kind. That's obviously that by definition, hard to come a lot. by. Thank you. And the show is fantastic. Uh, that really means the world. I haven't seen real. the whole season, but we're going to keep watching it. Thanks so. man. Thank you. Yeah. Would you say keep it crispy? Oh, it's how yeah, we end. Man. Keep it crispy. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, pal. Thanks, man.